a straight talking personal trainer who's been called the Gordon Ramsay of the fitness industry. Grade A stains, fing ball bag. He's on a mission to expose industry fads and fakers. We need to tell people why they're fat, more okay. so than just saying it. We've spoke about sort of steroids and stuff before on this podcast. As a young man in the UK, it's really difficult to obtain status. But then if they go to the gym and start lifting, they start taking testosterone, anethate twice a week, they start getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So steroids for young people is a cheat code to get attention and status, which is what most men from a psychological standpoint crave. You know, you've got plus size models. There is a big clothing brand in the UK that pivoted that way to get their plus size models on. They looked at the analytics and pivoted straight back. It hinders their sales. When you became, you had notoriety, you got a bit of fame. Did you have to go back and troll through your social media to make sure you were safe for today's culture? First book deal, I had to get rid of a whole Twitter account. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine this, I get a message and I was just scrolling my message request. This woman says, hey James, you might want to take a look at this. Straight away anxiety. It's a mother's Facebook group in the UK. And in that, one of the girls in it saying, I used to date James. I'm thinking of selling a story to the tabloids and any money that I would earn from that story, I would give to my newborn son. I went to my publishers, I was like, do I need to be worried? <laughs> And I'm Josh. And uh, welcome back to what is ordinarily one of the worst podcasts on planet Earth. But today we have a very special guest who far exceeds our normal catchment potential in the shape of sweary personal trainer guy, James Smith. How's it going, mate? Thank you very much for having me. <laughs> sweary personal trainer that guy. wasn't bad, was it? I thought it was all right. I like that. A bit well, reductive, but I think it's fairly accurate. So he was texting me last night and he was like, the first thing I'm going to ask him is... Uh, James, <laughs> bruh! How much do you bench? <laughs> I said, if I, do, if I do that, I'll get up and just storm out. Now, you know, I've, I've pivoted in my training direction the last few years. But, uh, you know, God, gym bros, it's always down to that, isn't it? They're like, no, nah, no squat, no deadlift. What do you bench? At the moment, I reckon, I reckon I maybe got five reps in me at 100 kg. But that's it. You're much bigger than I expected no, you to. Look at you can definitely it. do more than that, man. No, I got a yeah. sh shoulder injury that I made up a few years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so if anyone's like, why is your chest so poorly developed? I'm like, oh, that's shoulder. You know, that's <laughs> that rugby, rugby background. Well, James, you brought. We actually bought some uh, some new tonic before you arrived. Uh, but you actually brought us some, and I can say that the orange is is actually nicer than the. Uh, what do you call this? The monster killer. The, yeah, the tropical ice, the monster killer. It's real. This is really good stuff. This because which, like, which is say, the best one. I think okay. the orange is the nicest tasting one. Right, okay. You're going to crack one of them? I'll do well, a little bit later on. I'm going to do a taste test. Okay, right, I've yeah. had too much caffeine already. Yeah, I know. Me too. I'm sweating. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, uh, it's, it's interesting. Say you're doing a podcast or you're doing an edit, or let's even say you're going to script something for a piece of content. I would always, like, need a can of White Monster. I need caffeine to, like, prime myself. Even driving to record content, I used to go via the petrol station, get a big can of Monster or whatever, so that I was... I need to be on three, 400 milligrams of caffeine to be ready for content. If I go in like sleepy, I'm like, this is shit. You know, you need to be amped up. So, I get that, yeah. So then like priming yourself for a workout, we've had pre-workouts. And uh, when I was, I was initially a approached about the idea of doing like a nootropic supplement or a brain supplement or whatever. I was kind of like, well, guys, I have a love affair with all these drinks, C4. Then I'd get itchy face or I'd have a monster or whatever it is. So like, I can tell you the amount of caffeine in how many drinks. And even before like one big event I did before, I had a can of ghost because it had alpha GPC in it that really like makes me feel sharp. And I hid it in the back of the fridge so no one could find it. <laughs> so like I've been so like anal about, yeah, fizzy drinks and all that. I still love coffee, but so it was fun to make. You know, it's, it, it is really good stuff. I mean, one of the first things that I actually wanted to talk about was um, like energy drinks, prime. And because you, you've been quite outspoken about like prime to start with. Fucking and obviously now, you, now you've thrown your hat in the ring with your own uh, sort of performance drink. But can you tell us a little bit about prime um, as a s sports drink, supplement drink? So like, the, I can't, even Ghost recently have just released one as well, where like, if you want to have a hydration beverage, cool. If you want to have... Uh, you know, an energy drink cool. And actually the energy drink isn't bad. You know, it's got 200 milligrams caffeine, which is quite punchy. But if you want to have a small can and get, you know, Red Bull, same size cans, like 110, 120. So they've come in with like a double potency energy drink. But even then there was loads of stuff in the, the news about kids, you know, shouldn't be drinking this. But actually in the UK and Australia, they're much way less potent. They're about 120 milligrams, so nearly half. Uh, right, yeah. Because of legislations of the amount of caffeine you can have in a certain amount of like milliliters. But the hydration beverage is just dumb. And the way they go up against Powerade, Gatorade, and do these comparisons. So uh, a lot of us, when we train, especially if you look into like rugby, football, 
uh, you lose a lot of water, but you lose a lot of salt. So our replenishment tactic should be primarily sodium, salt, water, and then actually to speed up that process, you have glucose. So now next time you drink a Powerade or a Lucozade or whatever, you can actually taste the salt. And, you know, that's an important part of rehydration. Even like a saline drip, you would give people glucose, water, and salt. Now, the other electrolyte is potassium, which is found in bananas, which is why, you know, playing seven aside when you're younger, your mum and dad are like, <laughs> make sure you get your bananas in you, you know, like... Slices of orange. But you're not losing anywhere near as much potassium as sodium. So when you look at Powerade, Gatorade, all of these like industry leaders, high sodium, low potassium. But with Prime, it's high potassium, low sodium, because they almost want a virtue signal. It's got no glucose, it's got no salt, because salt's got like a negative connotation, yeah. which if you're obese and you've got hypertension, you're sat at home and you haven't exercised in three months, then maybe having a salt riddled beverage isn't going to be great for you because of the impacts it can have on your blood pressure, whatever. But as far as a rehydration supplement, it makes no sense. So they're, they're putting something out there. It's almost like they built the product with the advertising in mind to go against the other industry leaders than they actually did perform. So they've made a dehydration supplement, is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's, just not, <laughs> it's not ideal. But then their demographic isn't really dehydrated. They're school yeah, kids yeah. that want like something to show off. So yeah, but even <laughs> imagine this. <laughs> what are you laughing at? Imagine going to fucking school with like a bottle of drink. <laughs> Look at my... It's like, at least back in our day, we had those bobblehead footballs. You know what I mean? Mate, did you see what it was like when it first came out? Well, it's, it's near... Isn't that shop that you're always talking about near us? The one wakey Wines. Oh, wakey I don't, wines. I, don't, I don't talk about that's Wakey n- Wines. That's near us, like, man. Yeah. It's what's near me. Where they were selling boxes of it for like 200 quid. To be fair, trying to get all this stuff, it was like rocking our shit. I almost had to pay 70 quid on Amazon because I think they were reselling it. Yeah, the Is that bastard, what's happened? The bastards buy it. Are you saying like, are you going past it a bit like when KSI were like, don't buy it from Wakey Wines. Yeah, <laughs> definitely don't buy it but imagine like let's say uh someone in the youtube space like derek or whatever was to call me out and go actually rodilio rosé is dog shit i would then say hey guys okay for the next formulation we'll change it yeah, yeah. like i think there's power to be in that derek from more dates more plates yeah yeah, yeah 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 so like uh if if people are going to criticize you i think you should have at least one finger on the pulse to say do you know what fair play yeah we are actually going to change this because of what people have said we're going to reformulate it because a product should never be finished. It should be able to, you know, and you should be able to put your hand up. And if those two had just said, hey, we're going to finish the production of everything we've got and we're going to change the formulation. Yeah, yeah. But then they don't. They just like double down and get a load of footballers on board. What Did you, you ever think about, sorry, interrupt, did you ever think about that with our coffee? Could have, could have changed the blend on that. Maybe more people would have bought it. We could have done. Yeah, we'll, we'll take that back to the drawing board. 2024, we'll do that. I'll put we've, that had, we've had some failed business attempts on this podcast. In fact, it just cost us a fortune since, since we've started. So thanks for coming on. <laughs> <laughs> we might, might to recoup it, it could turn us around. <laughs> um, watching the video that you made, sort of showcasing the behind the scenes of bringing this to life with Chris Williamson, it was fascinating. Watching you do the taste test, saying about wanting to put the supplements in that was actually full doses. Like props to you for making it like that. And that's one of the best sort of, even though like obviously it is marketing it, it was fascinating to see you actually bring it to life oh, i was fair because i was like the whole time i was like people are going to come get me <laughs> i was like i've been i've been calling people out for nearly 10 years so like with every every bit of attention to detail it was fueled by fear i was <laughs> yeah. scared i was like sending derek cases please don't let us you know like anyone who's called us out in the industry yeah, tell us a bit about that because you sent uh, did you send some like um I guess, uh, studies to say, is this, is this bollocks, basically? Is this blend bollocks? There's a guy called Ben Carpenter. Have you seen him online? No. So uh, he's in the fitness industry and he's got some really compelling uh, content. For instance, he's got Crohn's, like quite bad. And every time he's been at his physical illness, like closest to death, he gets the most compliments about his physique. So he's like, <laughs> he's like, he's like, how fucked up is this? He's like, if I'm on the brink of death, like so shredded because my body literally can't absorb nutrients, people are like, hey bro, you look sick. You know, like, but like amazing sick. Hey bro, you look amazing. <laughs> yeah. Bro, this car is unreal. He's like, yeah, I'm nearly dying. So um, he puts out some really good content. He actually was on Lab Bible recently. So his uh, wife is Korean and it's like, uh, apparently in like uh, the, the certain circles, it's a bit disrespectful to marry outside to like a non-Korean speaking. I hope it's Korean. But he learned Korean for the wedding, stood up and did a speech. I saw that video. Yeah, so that's, yeah, yeah. that's the guy. So he learned... He learned how to speak that. Korean yeah. and spoke to the family and was like, thank you so much, you know, all of this. And like, I hope you accept me. But he secretly took these lessons for ages. But anyway, he's really like uh, reliable in the evidence-based circle. So I actually sent him the ingredients and said, mate, I'm doing a hit piece. I need your help. <laughs> I need your help. Because if I'd said to him, oh, I'm bringing out a product, he would have been nice. Yeah. So yeah, then he came back and he was like, oh, the, the, this is pretty legit. You know, you might want to swerve that one. So I was like, thank 
god. <laughs> that's class. That's a good idea. Yeah, though. yeah. And I get the fear though, because like if you spent your entire career basically debunking bullshit supplements, it's then hard to kind of say buy this thing which is kind of a supplement. So it must be it must be difficult to do that. I get that. Well, it's, it's funny as well though, because like you talk about you two are very aligned in. I've, I've been watching your content for probably like the last six months on YouTube. You two are very aligned on obviously the thoughts behind calories, maintaining weight, gaining weight, whatever it is, and they're the same with sponsorships. So you don't do any, like what do you say? Discuss you. What, what's your line? Your, your company line? Discuss you. Does it get paid or what? what yeah, I know. It's, you know that there's an episode of The Simpsons where some, <laughs> somebody's they, they, they're doing like a yard sale or something, and there's, the Homer has this old like rhinestone jacket, and it's was supposed to say Disco Stud on the back, but he got it misprinted. It says Disco Stu, and this you know the character Disco Stu. He's like, hey Stu, you should buy that. He goes, Disco Stu doesn't advertise. <laughs> so like, yeah, sometimes I just email that literally back to people or the meme. I'll say like, yeah, no, I'm not advertising. What it's am I myself? Is it, there, there'll be a point in your eyes. Let's say if you were to do a, a sponsorship. Way to be like, hey, this food challenge. I'm stop the pizza, stop the timer. This food challenge is actually sponsored, and there's there's a moment you can see it in people's eyes, and you're like, I'd rather just be less successful. I'd rather yeah. just have less money, and like not not having a dig at people that do a little bit of a dig, but like there's something just better. You could just be pr- proud about it, and also there's all, an element of ownership. And imagine I was listening to your last podcast where you were calling Tyson Fury. You're like, oh, he's a fucking, you know, he's an idiot. Like for- I did. Yeah, was it you? Probably. Yeah, it, was. it sounds like something I would say. Because you said he said he was going to fight for free and then he <laughs> U-turned on it and said that he wanted... A billion quid or yeah. something. Yeah. But then imagine your sponsor going, <clears throat> actually, we, uh, we've we got something going with him. We need you to tone it down. Like that that level yeah. of being controlled is is terrible. Yeah, no, I would say that. It's amazing. Like you've spoke openly on the podcast about turning down uh, like 40,000 pound 60 second ad reads on his videos. And, which is just an astronomical amount of money, but like you say, the damage to the audience and the damage to the bra- we went to we got invited to a Spotify event. This is why we we're the unsuccessful podcast because we got, we got invited to London to Spotify. We we go for a year and we were for yeah. this is it, boys. Like, he's he's getting excited. Oh, we're, we're in here. Spotify have invited us down. So we go to this event. Immediately, he gets pissed off because he's in London, <laughs> and then he's at the bar, pissed off because he's waiting for a beer, and he turns. Some guy goes, recognised him. He didn't know he got recognised. Are you enjoying it, mate? And he goes, I'm not fucking enjoying it. I'm in fucking London. I can't get a fucking drink. I just want to get out of this shit event. This You're guy making, this guy this, 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 this guy a developer. Co- it, took him, it took him eight minutes to, to make a cocktail. And he was making two of them. Like, oh, so I was mad, but yeah, the guy worked for Spot. Yeah, this was the developer for... Uh, would never have happened at Albert Schloss. Just <laughs> night out. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's, I, I had a bit of trouble recently. I went to Dubai Active uh, in Dubai, like a fitness expo, like body power, but in Dubai. Now, Dubai Active... I actually rate it fantastic. Been there a few years, but there's a muscle show on the other side. Now they were both owned by the same company that paid for my flights and accommodation. But I went in my videographer to the other side and was like, you know, whey protein isn't far removed from filtered milk. You know, it's actually derived in the cheese making process. And I was like, look at all these bodybuilders that have been on anabolic steroids for five, 10 years. If anything, these guys are drug abusers that have inflated their muscle mass size using a myriad of drugs yet they're sat there next to tubs of cheese as if that was the reason that they're big and i was like this whole room has been built on lies i was like (laughs) and i literally was just like isn't this isn't this crazy like how is how are people not seeing this for what it is like you've got guys that are literally like five years away from a heart attack throwing out sample sachets of cheese and i was like (laughs) but then that was live for 20 minutes and i got an email they're like you need to take that down right now and i was like oh, actually, yeah, I didn't think of it like that. I thought I was just kind of exposing the truth. They were like, this is part of the same business as the business that we oh. used to buy. And I was like, oh, shit, shit, shit. <laughs> I had to cut the intro out of my video, ruin the stats for it. Well, man. That's so true, though. Yeah, I mean, like, we, we've we've spoke about sort of steroids and stuff before on this podcast. Because you look at, like, big celebrities, um, The Rock. No, he's never openly spoke about it. And we, you know, we're speculating. Shaky, we're, we're shaky we're legal speculating. Ground now. We don't but, care though. Nothing. All these celebrities like The Rock, Ryan Reynolds, Mark Wahlberg, Hemsworth, Chris Hemsworth. Oh yeah, are, they've got to be on some extracurriculars, right? You'd be an idiot not to. If you think about it, right? Let's say uh, you get a, a movie role in the next Thor, and they go, "We want to put you on a bit of juice." We could do CGI. We're going a bit of juice. They're going to be like, "Yeah, let's go on a bit of juice." It's like a twelve-week holiday. And mm. the more attention and doctors that you have, the better that cycle is going to be for you. If you're getting your bloods done once every 10 days, they're going to make sure that everything's on point. 
you get a doctor to put needles in three times a week so you don't get too many fluctuate. It would, it'd be amazing. Like, oh, you get to gain loads of muscle mass and enjoy your training and get pumps that make you feel like your arm's going to explode. Who's going to say no thanks to that? It's, it's difficult. And although I've called out a lot of people for steroids before, it's tough because if they do become transparent about what they're on, people are going to go, well, the rock's on, you know, 500 milligrams a week. So therefore I'm going to go on that. So it's this really tricky place for like, I don't know how we kind of navigate that. There's a lot of young people in the UK on steroids. Now, this is a theory I've got. I'd be interested to hear your takes on this. So as a young man in the UK, it's really difficult to obtain status. Like you're not going to be successful in your your work life. At, at 22, if you say to the boss, I've got an idea, they go, shut the fuck up, be 22. So in so many domains, you can't drive a nice car because you can't afford it. Yep. You can't buy a nice house because you can't afford it. You, you know, there's not many things you can actually do unless you're the captain of the local rugby club. For most men, there's not a lot going on. But then if they go to the gym and start lifting, they start taking, you know, testosterone, anything twice a week, they start getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Then suddenly they actually silently climb the hierarchy of the men's gym to the point that other people go, hey, bro, what's your training split? Hey, bro, can you give me a little a few tips on bench press? Hey, bro. Then people start congregating to the big guy in the gym as like, you know, the alpha of the pack. So as an 18, 19 year old, you can actually accomplish a lot of status. You'll probably get a fucking endorsement on the way there you know, protein companies, clothing brands, they're all going to be magnetized towards you, let alone social media algorithms. So steroids for a lot of young people is a cheat code to get attention and status, which is what most men from a psychological standpoint crave. And what are you going to do, say, to that person who wants to be endorsed by Gymshark? Now, nah, bro, do it natural. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking when it was like, if anyone, if you wear Gymshark gear, don't like hurt me or anything. But I always think there's, there's no greater sign to me of somebody with no personality than the fact that they wear Gymshark gear. Yeah, but I mean, like, it, it, it swings both ways. So you've got, like, the Gymshark bros, or, like, previously, like, what you'd see on front of magazines, full of steroids, Gymshark bros, and now you've got plus-size models, like, which is the polar, like, it's the polar opposite, like... What? I, won't, I won't say it's Gymshark, but there is a big clothing brand in the UK that pivoted that way to get the plus-size models on. They looked at the analytics and pivoted straight back. Oh, really? So a lot of businesses now, from a business decision, from a top-down decision will not put plus size models on their websites or adverts because it hinders their sales. So like you can be woke, but at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it has to be a business decision. Yeah. So yeah, you'll see a lot of these ones pivoting back now from that. Um, I've never won Gymshark. Like uh, I actually met the owner, Ben Francis in a McDonald's in New York. So I was in the airport and I was like, you know, I saw the back of his head and I recognized him. I never met him before. <laughs> And I walk in and I see, I see him and I'm like, McDonald's, New York in an airport. And I said hello to him. And, you know, I've actually ripped into Gymshark models quite a lot. But to be fair, fair play, if you're getting 10 grand a month to wear clothes, that, as far as a mortgage, that could put your family in like a five bed house with a pool. But they're just easy targets. Same reason as vegans, people on keto. Like it's nothing personal. Oh, you just, it, Keel. It's just easy targets. You know, like why wouldn't I? And people go, why would you pick on bodybuilders? I go, they never buy my programs. So why, <laughs> why wouldn't I pick on bodybuilders? You know, like so many personal trainers worry about what other PTs think. Yeah. They're the only people never to buy your product. Yeah. Same. That's true. I do feel slightly hypocritical because I do actually, I did used to own two Gymshark stringers, which I did not purchase myself, I should add. And I did wear them a few times. So uh, if anyone sees, an, there probably wouldn't have been a picture with it. But in case <laughs> you see like, one. Like, it's somebody going on Twitter from 2006. I heard yeah. you said on, a, on a, a live stream that, when you became, you had notoriety, you got a bit of fame. Did you have to go back and sort of troll through your social media to make sure you were safe for today's culture? First book deal, I had to get rid of a whole Twitter account. <laughs> <laughs> I've not done that yet. Maybe I should do that. So my publishers were like, right, we need to, we, you're going to get some exposure. People are going to come for you. We need to make sure that we're like safe. From a brand perspective, it was fine. But when HarperCollins came along, they were like, no, nah, we, need, we need our authors to have some level of decorum. So I had to take just because you look at tweets from 15 years ago, yeah. you could say different things. And even, even to my worst enemy in the fitness industry, when someone pulls up their receipts from 10 years ago, I don't think that's cool. Like yeah. even if it was V shred, right. So, you know, you, <laughs> I know that guy, he's the guy that said the fucking, what is, he said the, he was describing, sorry, I got this really made me laugh though. He was talking about doing the, you know, uh, basically cable pushdowns with a bar. And he's like, you want to do a compound compound exercise for your triceps, like a cable pushdown, like, so an isolation exercise then, yeah? Like, he was, he was calling that a compound exercise. I thought, how the fuck are you getting away with this on YouTube? He's just a face. And also, he might have done that intentionally to get comments. 
Yeah. So a lot of people, oh, especially in the TikTok world, will use the wrong word. My most viewed short on YouTube was where I actually got incorrect maths. So going from a 6 kg dumbbell, uh, going from a 4 kg dumbbell to a 6 kg dumbbell is a 50% increase. I said a 33% increase and got like 10,000 comments of people <laughs> uh, correcting my smart maths. Asses. Um, so some people might do it, but yeah, let's say V Shred was like, you know, me and him going at it online, whatever. If someone was to pull out his tweets from 2008, I'd be like, nah, leave, th- leave them be. Let's yeah, not, yeah. let's not pull out things from, you know, f- that, that shit pisses me off. But yeah, I, I did have to be careful with that. But I remember like, imagine this, I get a message and I was just scrolling my message requests. This woman says, hey, James, you might want to take a look at this. Straight away anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> Click on the link. And it's a mother's Facebook group in the UK. Um, and in that, one of the girls in it saying, I used to date James. I'm thinking of selling a story to the tabloids and any money that I would earn from that story, I would give to my newborn son. And it was one of my exes that I finished with bad terms like 12 years ago. So I had to get legal straight away, like at the ready, so that if that did go, that we could sue her and she'd be fucked. It never went out. Even women in that group were like, what the fuck? You know, it was only like 30, 40 women in like an area group. One of them dubbed her in. I went to my publishers. I was like, do I need to be worried? They went, of age? I went, yes. <laughs> <laughs> they went, consent? I went, yes. They went, nothing to worry about. <laughs> Isn't it terrifying? Like the more not right. I'm not as attractive as James. So like, I, I, I don't really have too much of that to worry about. I don't really have a long list of, uh, <laughs> yeah. of, of, of like jilted lovers or anything. So I'm all right. But any man with a beard and a snapback, you know, you could be, you could be put up on a police lineup. They go, yeah, could have been, <laughs> no, been, been, been dodgy. Yeah. I said that with Alpha as Christmas too. And he came out dressed like, Full beard meets food, snap back, jacket on. I went, you come out in full, you come out in full character. character. Like I don't fucking normally dress like he that. comes out in full character and wonders why 50 people want selfies on a day out and then complains about it. I think I, I did not complain. I complained at the end when it was like mega drunk people slobbering on me a little bit and not being very <laughs> respectful. But most of the evening, I, I think I was quite... Um, What's the weirdest thing that's happened to you since you've got notoriety over the years? Because you're very outspoken, uh, which is a positive thing, really. But have you had any, you had any negative... Not really. There was only one girl that was rude once in Sydney and she was just very drunk. And at the back, she actually went after one of my friends. She started calling him a clout chaser. I was like, excuse me, that's my friend. Somebody said that about you. Do you remember when you were in that video, they were like, we're careful oh, yeah. for that ginger guy. He, he looks like your classic well, yeah, clout chaser. We, we, uh, we tested out this. I sent you the video as an example. So I went on his channel, what, four months ago? We did like a chicken wing challenge. It was only a year ago, that man. Was it? What, what, fuck anyway, you. we did a long time ago because we were... Obviously, trying, he's going to get more people. Like, you're going on his channel later on today. You're going to do a challenge. <laughs> but yeah, somebody calling, saying, calling, calling me a clout chaser. Yeah. Even though we've been, we've been doing podcasts for a while. The two year yeah, podcast for long. two years. And yeah. first one we put like five years ago. People mm-hmm. are wankers, right? But this is one thing. I'm not at your level yet, but I was working with like a, a YouTube sensei. His name's Ed Lawrence. He has a channel called Film Booth. Oh, he's a legend, is Ed. Creator Booth. Yeah. I, 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 so, Ed, back in lockdown, we used to chat all the time and he had no, like he had a few subscribers and he's absolutely blown up recently. He is amazing. He's Ed. Shout out to Ed. And uh, yeah, so he, I did some like one-to-one calls with him. It was like therapy. It was better than therapy actually. <laughs> Cause I'd be like, yeah, this, uh, this video I've started, I'm getting a lot of hate on it. And he was like, good. It's being shown to a new audience. And he was like, <laughs> he was like, if you're not getting hate in your videos, it's not done well enough on the algorithm. And I was like, it's a good way to look at it. <laughs> like, so now when I start getting all the hated comments, I'm like, that video is doing well. Keep that title and thumbnail as it is. You know, <laughs> one video, everything's complimentary. I'm like, we need to change something here. You know, so like, <laughs> Do you change stuff a lot, like after you upload or <clears throat> not so much? Not so much because even if my original title and thumbnail is not great, the one I replace it with is probably just not going to be great either. It's just going to be different. I, I, I've only, I did that on the, the music video we did at Christmas. Yeah, That's the only, th- only thing real I think I've ever done it on. Because normally I just think You've I changed would. that twice, don't you? Is it the... Is it the- yeah, I, changed, I changed it like temporarily so that when I uploaded, it was a little bit um, duplicitous because I had around the, ne- the time the next video went up, I thought I'd change the title of that one and the thumbnail so yeah. people would think it was a different video, which normally I would not do. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I did it on that one occasion just because it's something that people wouldn't normally watch, if that makes sense. It, t- it takes the fun out of it a little bit though. Like, So I think uh, Diary of a CEO, Stephen Bartlett, I think they have 12 thumbnails 
and they do one an hour to then look at the click-through rates of each one. And I'm like, guys, that's not living. Oh my God. I can't believe it, he, it He's done, like, I think they're going even deeper than that, don't they? They, do, they run like Facebook ads to it and split test Facebook ads to like a small audience. They're, and even with the questions before they get a guest on, right? So there's sort of split test questions so that they ask the right questions within the podcast. Sounds like a lot of work. Like <laughs> just have better conversations. You yeah. know, like, you wouldn't have to do that. You know, yeah, there's, there's a trend at the moment, right? And not to at, well, slightly to at people. In reels and shorts, everyone's like, if you followed me, you'd know that. And I'm like, mate, <laughs> come on. And there's been a couple of times I slipped into the trap of asking people to sub on a channel. And I was like, do you know what? Like at the end of a video, I'll go, there's a floating head if you're interested. If not, here's a video recommended by YouTube. That's as beggy as I'm getting, yeah. right? And then at the end of it, I'm like, or oh, don't follow me. I'm not your dad. You know, like <laughs> just, I hate it where people are like, they'll do like the intro to a video. And they're like, make sure you like, make sure you subscribe. <laughs> and you're like, that's not getting, no one's there going, okay. You know, like <laughs> if you make really good content, that, that you don't need to ask. Yeah, yeah that, is, that is true. I think that if you can entertain or inform or hopefully both and you do it consistently, there's no point in asking people. Well, that goes quite nicely into sort of, with, with your social media following, I'm right in saying that the first sort of two or three years, did it take you three or four years to get like 5,000 followers on Instagram? Four years to get 10K. Right. Then four years to get a million. So consistency over time is just like, it, it's that. Mate, my first year I got 800 followers. I was just on Facebook and I was like, this is sick. Then my second year I got to 1,800. There was more than my rugby club. I fucking walked into training. <laughs> I was like, Reading Indians Rugby Club, this club's 100 years old. So I'm like, I'm more famous than this rugby club. Like at 1800, I was like, I'm fucking big time. When I hit three and a half thousand, I was like, yeah, we're cooking. And then everything after that was just weird. You know, I'm sure this is the same for you, right? You get to a point where like, me, I love video games when I was younger. So everything's gamification. So getting 2.7 million views on a video to me is just a high score. It's not 2.7 million people. And you kind of play those games for long enough. Then you go into a shop somewhere and three people recognize you. You're like, whoa, this game has consequences. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's weird. But yeah, so for me, for years, nothing really popped off. Then I was Facebook. Then when Instagram came along, I wasn't keen on it. And then it forced my hand and I didn't get an Instagram account for business till 2016, which was quite late. And I didn't get into YouTube until maybe a year ago. So I've been continually late to the party for every platform. And that kind of G's me up a bit because I'm like, as some people are getting complacent, I'm just getting warmed up. Yeah. That's quite a positive story that though. Cause a lot of people say, is it too late to start a podcast? Is it too late to start on Instagram? Is it too late to start on whatever? It's people not. Say that, people have been saying that about YouTube for like years, man. Like <laughs> it's too late. Like you didn't miss the gold. It's the only part of like Alphabet or the larger holding companies that's consistently, not just consistently been in profit, but consistently grown in profit for about like 12 years or something. Like they're only putting more money into it. You know, that's why YouTube, because the thing about YouTube is right. You get people that maybe don't do so well on it and you'll often find them complaining. In fact, speaking of which, I'll talk about KSI, right? You put that tweet out because they had a 10 out of 10 video or something. Sidemen, who was like, oh, oh, thanks, guys, you didn't watch. Like, <laughs> it's not their responsibility to watch, it's your responsibility to make something which is not, which is unmissable, right? And I just thought, like, it's it's a strange thing, isn't it? That, um, I don't know, it, I, to me, like, you can't, you can, I don't think you can ever really get, because you, YouTube make money out of people watching videos. It's not, it's, they're not in thinking that they don't want to, I'm not articulating this very well, but they're not trying to stop people they're not from watching against it. you. Yeah. The point is that if you make something good that people are going to watch and a lot of people then do watch, the idea is that, you know, they they want that to happen because then they're going to make, everyone's making money, right? So I think it's, yeah, it's, if people think oh, it's too late to get into it, if you keep waiting, there's no, I mean, it's not going to get any worse. You know what I mean? Like, you might as well do it now. Ed said this, he goes, Every video you make, YouTube wants to put it in front of a billion people. You've just not made it good enough. Yeah. And then another thing that I saw in his course was lurking in his Discord. One of his members made 33,000 US dollars from 800 views because he closed so much business out of those 800 views. So All right. High ticket program, maybe 10, 15 clients from 800 views. So like, he was like, everyone that kind of turns up to YouTube kind of thinks, fuck, I need to make a million views. And I even have PTs that are like, oh, I want to make some extra rev from YouTube. And I'm like, hmm. So you can either wait until you've got videos that are going viral or you could have a smaller niche of videos to get two, 3,000 views. And out of those, you might get 300 emails. And out of that email marketing campaign, you might make 15 sales. And then you might upsell. Like people, I think, think the only way to make money on YouTube is to get massive amounts of views because people like yourself have done it and they think it's easy. And they think, okay, cool. Yeah, I'll just get a few million views and make a few thousand dollars. 
where in fact, for the majority of businesses, even 10,000 views per video should be enough for them to make substantial sales within their business. Yeah, that's, well, that's the thing we were talking about when Damien, we had a guest on called Damien Talks Money. That's the name of his channel. And we were talking about that, weren't we? How like YouTube is not like, what I do is not a business. It's just, I'm just trying to, I'm just goofing off. I'm just trying to entertain people. But for businesses, it's like, you know, with Charlie, the guy that you work with, yeah. the watch dealer, it's a good way to supplement because it's, it's free to use, basically. If you can, if you can knock up some videos, then you can, you can, at least you can, if nothing else, even if you're not in at 10, you can drive some kind of purchase yeah, we, of a service or a, or a we product. We run a, a YouTube channel for a, a Rolex aftermarket dealer, or like a grey market dealer, and it's quadrupled his business in a year by putting him out there. And he's, to be fair, he's had a good year. Like it, it's, he's up to like 30,000 subscribers and he's doing good views, but not like you're like a unicorn in the space, you know, with the views. Is that a compliment? Yes. All right, thanks. It, it boils down to trust though, right? Because if you go to a restaurant and you say, this was really nice, people are going to go to that restaurant because you said it was nice. You're not incentivized to say that you know like if you don't say something's nice we can read between the lines you know like uh, <laughs> good I, good <laughs> i think trust and attention are two really important commodities they're like if you can get both of those you're going to do really well and uh, there's there's a weird thing like i think people have, such as your channel you've got into this kind of semi mukbang semi entertainment semi storyline oh, i hate that word mukbang mukbang <laughs> you're right though yeah and like for myself, it's super strange. I watch your videos whilst I'm waiting for my missus to like, she's cooking dinner, prepping. It's in the final stages. I'm hungry. I need something to satiate my my hunger for that meal. And I weirdly, I put it on and I'm like, I'm enjoying watching you eat because I've got to wait 10 minutes. <laughs> and like- I've the, got a bone to pick with you anyways. My cute guy, I saw the video, well, I saw part of the video that you did. Um, thank you, by the way, for doing a video about me. Um, but you, you had to pick that. I know you didn't do it on purpose, but you had to pick them where I lost, didn't you? <laughs> you had to alright so imagine this I swear <laughs> on my dog's life it was the most recent upload to that video you're right it must have been given the timing and it was the first one I've ever seen where you lost <laughs> and like so those Lad. reactions in that are completely natural and um, so do you know what like I w- I've been watching your stuff and the more I've been watching it the more I've been getting fed it from YouTube to the point that I was like I was watching you on my TV so I was like, I need to get my phone out and subscribe. You know, I was like, I was like I'm being... Ah, oh, thanks, mate. No, you no, actually subscribed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You subbed? Yeah, and I've DM'd you before. I've, I've, well, I've got a while. Oh, you, what? Sh- you have? <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure. Hold on. Let's have a look. Not, not, on, not on YouTube. I think it might be on... it. And again, I'm... I got a DM it. from... Don't worry about it. I got a DM from Lad, Lad Baby when I was out on a night out last week. I fucking deleted it without reading it. <laughs> it's ideas from... <laughs> Simon, I'm like, fuck off. Mate, I DM'd you on Insta and you got back to me straight away. Oh, see, I did. I saw it replied. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He said so, some mad DMs like Benny Blanco, all these people. He just blanket deletes everybody. I was, and I was just like, mate, I'm like watching you. And it was more like a, being a content creator in a smaller space, seeing someone bigger doing it. I was like, you know, let's let's just com- be complimentary, mate. Great stuff, great content. I think that people underestimate your production as well. You know, you got GoPro, DSLR, You've got like good audio. You've got all of these kind of things here. Even the way that you set up all of your videos, I was like, I was appreciative of it. Oh, you're going to make me blush. Thank no, you like, very much. But then there are so many people trying to imitate it that don't see the full picture. And there was part of me that you were going around America when I was really getting into like watching one a day. And I was like, fucking hell, this guy's just traveling the world. <laughs> I was like, what a job. And I'm like saying to my missus, what a job, what a job. I was like, this is amazing. I was like, imagine that, imagine that. Just going around the world. I was like, fair enough. He could probably do one every few days. But I was like, so many are like, I'm out there with like a, a, a drought of ideas, beating myself up, being depressed in the shower. Like, why am I not creative anymore? And I was like, <laughs> you can just Google restaurants around, fire on a message. Hey, I've got, Bear subscribers. <laughs> I never and, said, I never, I try not to message him actually. And then, yeah, so like, um, and then I was like, what a, a gap in the market. People are now invested in it. I looked through your comments and I was like, people enjoy this. They're coming back. They want, they don't, and a lot of time people want to see you fail. I think people just want to see you because you're, even just your demeanor with people at the restaurant, everything else, people can tell, you know, like Rogan, when they tried to cancel him being a racist, everyone's like, he's not, we've listened to him too much. You can tell a lot about someone by watching them interact with people. Maybe a few videos you could have faked it, but like over years of being like that, they're like, nice guy, big belly, restaurant, food <laughs> yeah. challenge. The chefs are always trying to stitch you up as well. 
I can oh, see that yeah. where, where they put the extra chips. I'm like, you fucking bastard. <laughs> <laughs> that's, you know, the worst part about that is actually is when people, this is the power of the internet, right? Is that's happened a couple of times and the, the place will end up getting review bombed by people that have never dined there. I, would, I hate that. That, that happens that, 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 actually I didn't mind it because it's a big chain, but the Hard Rock Hotel in uh Florida. I think it was Florida, but they like they really f- fucked me over there because it, it, was, it, was, it was basically the challenge is like a really big slice of cake, so it looks cool, it's a bit different, not a burger or a breakfast or whatever. And it's supposed to come with like a regular sized burger, regular sized portion of fries. The big deal is like the four pound piece of cake, and he brings out this colander of like five pounds of fries. And I, to be fair, it's the only one where I've looked a bit right because I'm like, you stitched me up. And I was, not, I was, I wasn't mad that I was was gonna lose. I was mad because I'd done all the preamble, like the drone shot, or whatever. And I'm looking forward to doing it because it's different. And I'm like, right. So now I don't even have a, you know, I, I can't make this an entertaining video because I know I'm gonna lose. Yeah. So, but yeah, then after that, <laughs> they messaged me. They were like, oh, I was so sorry. You know, do you want to come back and do it again? I'm like, the fuck out, man. That was like four months ago. <laughs> but it was because they'd been like, like 400 people had left them a one star review on TripAdvisor, which I would not. Please don't do that. Please don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's interesting, actually. Like, I, I love looking at like why people are successful on YouTube. And actually, I came to realize that if there's an unfamiliar face in a thumbnail, you're not going to watch it. And my first video I saw of Ed was where he put Mr. Beast in his thumbnail. And his video was, I think, tricks Mr. Beast uses to hook your attention. I was like, clicked on it. And then I realized Ed was kind of the vessel of that information. So then I was in the shower. This way, when I haven't got good ideas, I have a shower. And I'm just there because like my mind can't get distracted <laughs> in the shower. You're kind of pottering about. Have you ever noticed that like you wash yourself the exact same? You're on autopilot in the shower. Even when you get out, you're on autopilot. I still always forget to dry my back. So like, <laughs> but I'm in there and I was like, I've been watching your videos and I was like, surely there's an angle here for fat loss. And the video I found of you talking about how you stay in shape. Fat- Lad, that was so old, man. <laughs> that was so old. I was like, oh my God, this is like- That haircut's fresh, like, man. That. Yeah, I'm like, you could have used the one we did on the podcast but not a bit any sorry go on. but it's five years old so i was like i'm kind of digging up dead bodies here from a few <laughs> years ago just to try and get some relevancy but then that video has done like nearly half a million views because of you being in the thumbnail so i did try and lever your brand to try and boost mine but that's complimentary and um <laughs> oh, yeah, i don't give a shit about that i don't know unless people steal it but then it, it's so like uh clever to you know where people kind of use each other in that in that way to do it but now all of these b-tech personal trainers have now done the same comparisons in short form they're like there's a food guy out there who eats food this is how he stays in shape i was like motherfuckers <laughs> i went back five years to come up with this story <laughs> and you're now trying to fucking repurpose it do you not think like you know to me the terrifying thing is is how many people ask me you know like if i check my messages right now there'll be like at least 20 or something oh, bro bro how, what's the secret how do you stay in shape and i'm like how can you have such a poor, un- be a fully grown adult and have such a poor understanding of nutrition, but energy balance, right? Thermodynamics that you don't understand because there's, there's one video a week, right? So if I saw somebody else doing that, admittedly, I'm, I'm availed of, you know, the, the information. I would think, right, so he eats a lot of food that one time a week. So the rest of the week, he's probably just chilling out, you know, and he's eating maybe a thousand calories a day or 1200 or whatever. And I just think, how are, are we in a position whereby so many people are still buying, you know, buying these supplements because they think that's the trick and they think there is a s- secret other than just like basic mathematics. And to me, that's genuinely terrifying. It's got to be marketing, right? I mean, I, we, I was just saying, we went to Centre Parks over Christmas and we were, it was like 11 a.m. We were driving uh, subs at services and there was like a fat mum with a fat chubby little kid with a KFC. Can we say that? Yeah, happy. Can you use that? Is that all right? And you go, you're supposed to say like obese or overweight. It was a good ad- adjective, all right? Uh, right. <laughs> Jamie Oliver didn't do a good job, did he, back in the day? Because like, if that's the nutrition that that they're clearly eating on a regular basis. That's the that's where we're at. And yeah. you, when we did the behind the scenes of the music video, you said, if you want the secret, the secret's here. He's got a tray this big, just with <laughs> a mountain of lettuce it. leaves, chicken, you know, cucumbers and some tomatoes and a bit of a bit of like fatty yeah, he, sauce. He went out, to, he was like, he didn't really do much on that shoot. So I said, get me some fucking lunch. So he knows me. He goes, like, gets like fucking three of these massive, like 500 gram bags of just like salad, like lettuce. And I just had, what, I had like four packets of chicken yeah, on there, a yeah. little bit of dressing. I'm like, I'm set. But man. you explained it perfectly in the video about Adam, you know, like for quality of food over quantity, you know, McDonald's or a KFC, you're not going to get it. I always say as well, like if you, if you went around your nans and she had a fat dog, you'd be like, nan, less meals, more walks. Like, yeah. that's it. You wouldn't be like, put the dog on keto. Did you say that to Piers Morgan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was like, I had that one yeah, ready a, for him. He's a twat, one. isn't he? But like, um, <laughs> it's quite kind to me that day. But we use the same publisher. So, uh, <laughs> so like, um, yeah, but there are, there are, com- and do you know what? My first six, seven years of my career, definitely I was kind of like move more, eat less. Then I am open to more complexities where, for instance, 
some people might, you know, be stressed out, um, very poor situations. They might be working through like trauma in their life or whatever. Then they get to a level of obesity where they don't sleep properly. So they stop breathing in their sleep. They get sleep apnea. Now they wake up tired. People that sleep deprived typically get more hunger cravings, all of that. So I remember I did a YouTube video where you've got this uh, Azempic, Wegovi, semaglutide, fat loss, diabetes drug. And straight away I was like, fucking hell, injectable fat loss, you lot are idiots. <laughs> and like, I remember being like, in what fucking world do you have to inject something? And I'll never forget, there was one comment from someone and they were so polite in it. He was like, James, been watching your content for years. Love your content, big fan of you. Without coming across condescending, he was like, this drug has changed my life. And he's like, please reconsider your stance. And I was like, okay. So I went to a peptide clinic in Australia, got a semaglutide dose through an actual script from a doctor. We're a bit behind here on the peptide side in the UK. And he was like, how much do you weigh? It's like 98 kilograms. What do you want to be? I was like 92. And that was honest. I was overweight. I'm technically obese on the BMI. Although I can just carry it well. Got a good suction. <laughs> Online PTs from the chest up, mate. You know, get that camera out. So I was like, cool, I'm going to do maybe a month on semaglutide. First, and people are going to think I'm fucking sponsored by this. The first injection I had, next day I was like, this doesn't work. And I had like a microwave meal. We have like healthy ones in Oz. And I got halfway through and I just put it back in the fridge to the dog for a walk. Then on the dog walk, I was like, I've never done that. Right? So there was just part of my brain that was like, you're done now, which I just don't get. So then I had dinner, ate dinner with my missus, completely normal. But usually I go straight to the fridge. Before I've even put the plate in the dishwasher, I'm like, I'll have a few bits of chocolate, finish or something sweet. Nice. <laughs> and then... um. <laughs> I just didn't. She was like, do you want some chocolate? I was like, no, thanks. And then it was only a few days in that I was flying somewhere. I got up super early, got to the airport, went into the lounge. And usually I'm like, oh, I've got to, make, got to get your money's worth. I had half an apple in the lounge. And my missus looking at me like, who's this? You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> who is this? I lost like four and a half kilograms in two weeks. But at no point did I feel like I was dieting. My, I became indifferent to hunger. So it wasn't like I felt sick all the time. I just no longer had these cravings. And when I did, I was a lot more sensible with it. There was one time though that I knew I was chronically under eating protein and I forced down a protein shake and I was ill for two hours from like the semaglutide. My stomach, like it felt like I was getting stomach cramps from it. I was like, this is pretty bad. And after two weeks, I decided to come off the semaglutide because if I'd continued, I knew I was going to put myself at an increased chance of injury because I just wasn't eating enough to be doing combat sports and wrestling. And if I tore my quad and my hamstring, I would have been livid. What, for a fucking YouTube video? <laughs> and now, when I see those people, like the chronically obese people going into KFC, I feel like I, I just want to sneak up behind them and just inject them. <laughs> <laughs> and just give them a small dose of semaglutide. And they'll be like, I'll see you in seven days, you fuck. Uh, so what is, is it a peptide, did you say? It's technically a peptide. It's, um, they call it... Uh, like a ghrelin antagonist and it slows down your uh, digestion and it also uh, helps your body produce insulin. It works pretty much by slowing down your digestion as a primary mover so that you always have these levels of satiety. So you're always feeling full. Now I will say, I uh, spoke to Chris Williamson about this. He was like, check your rest and heart rate. And my rest and heart rate just jumped the day I took it. Now there are some people that get like stomach paralysis and these issues from it. And I don't think it's safe to be used as a fat loss drug unless you're staring down the barrel yeah. of, you know, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, stroke. And there are, and for some reason, there's no nuance. One of the YouTube video about it, everyone's like, you've been bought off. But I was like, those people out there that are really struggling to eat less and move more, I think these like injectable solutions, which are only going to get better over time, is actually the better of two evils. Because if you think this peptide's bad for you, try fucking having a stroke or a heart attack. But I now feel the fitness industry is going to go, oh, reduction of food intake without effort. Where do I sign up? Mm. So yeah, these um, different types of, uh, yeah, types of fat loss, diabetes drugs. I think we're going to only see more of these in time to come. What are peptides? Because I heard one of the guys at the gym, like I think he busted his elbow or something at jujitsu and he was like, oh, I'm starting on peptides. And, I'm, and then I like, Google, quick Google, saw like a quote from uh, Andrew Huberman and it said that it, is it help, does it assist with repair? So you've got uh, peptides or amino acids that you inject and it sends like a signal to your body to do something. So uh, semaglutide technically, I believe is a peptide, but then you've got others. So there's two uh, that are taken together called CJC1295 and ipomrelin, which are both growth hormone secretagogues. So if you've got supplementation here on the left and you've got steroids on the right, peptides are this new middle ground. 
So when you take ipramelin and CJC, it signals your pituitary gland to produce more growth hormone. So you could administer growth hormone yourself. If you take it from the outside in, it's exogenous. And if you do it from the inside out, it's endogenous. Or did I just get that the wrong way around? No, that's right. Yeah, cool. Yeah, good man. So, um, <laughs> that, we still like I'm saying, yeah, that's right. You're easily an expert. I just, I'm good with words, but yeah. So if I inject growth hormone into my body, there could be some reactions by my body going, why is growth hormone so high? So when you inject testosterone, for instance, the body's like, yo, we've got too much testosterone until the testicles stop doing their job and they atrophy. But now these peptides are pretty interesting because they're signaling your body to make more of something you want. So I did, um, maybe like eight, nine weeks on CJC, Ipromerlin, and you take it before bed, you give yourself a little jab in the stomach with an insulin pin, and you get this like hot flush, and it feels nice. <laughs> You're like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> that was the cunt face you were talking about earlier. You <laughs> told me to do it, sorry. Like, you told me to do the jizz face, that's the face. I, I just, I, it's been so long, I'd forgotten what it's like. But, uh, sorry, go on. But you can't eat for two hours before your injection because of the way the insulin uh, and growth hormone kind of work against each other. But then I think I was getting in better shape from not snacking before bed. So uh. <laughs> everyone's like, oh, these peptides must work. I was like, I think it's not me nailing bars of chocolate before I go to bed. But then there's another breed of them, you could say. So you've got uh, BPC-157. I've heard that a few and times. And TB-500, I think it's called. They sound like characters from Star Wars. <laughs> and these Write are, that down, George. You need some of those. These are healing peptides. So they help your body produce more of uh, the things you need to heal better. So if you were to bust your elbow, uh, knee injury, whatever it is, you could take these peptides to heal quicker. Now, I'm not sure if the research is completely solid on them, but a lot of athletes are using it. And I know that Rogan is calling for the UFC to like be more lenient with these because you want athletes to be able to heal quicker. And then the only one above that would be stem cells, which I'm pretty sure they get from like placentas or embryos. And then they uh, there's like really nutrient dense shit yeah. that they can inject locally. <laughs> But like all of these things should be, we should have like an open mind to them. But the, the peptides research is still like, in the UK, you can't go to a peptide clinic because it's still like research, research chemicals or whatever. But for that reason, they're a lot cheaper. here, Right. Because you don't get a doctor's script or go via a doctor where in Australia you do. Because I think I saw like Andrew, a human or someone say like, they're really good. But if you have a tumor or something that's like in your body, it will make the tumor grow. And I was like, I'm out. <laughs> whatever that is, I'm out. So the growth hormone secreted gogs, similar to taking growth hormone, if you've got like a, a tumor in you, the same mechanisms that would allow you to potentially develop tissue faster and turn over muscle protein synthesis, all those things would potentially cause a tumor to grow faster as well. So like I, I did it for a few weeks to see if it was really like life changing. I'd say my training morale felt a lot better, but it's nowhere near as good as testosterone. Yeah. I mean, tell us about, you've, uh, you've openly spoke about it before, but you took testosterone, you took steroids when you were younger. What steroids did you take and what were the effects? So with testosterone, you can, uh, depending on how frequently you're intending to pin, or to inject, you get different types. You might have anything, SIP, like all of these. But basically what we're trying to differentiate is how long that's going to last in your system. So I would take anything, which as long as I pin twice a week was fine. Now, the more infrequently you pin, the more you can be susceptible to fluctuations where you might be too high at some points, too low at others. So if you're afraid of needles, you might want to look into like creams. But then if you use the creams, if you hold a baby, you might get the cream on the baby or whatever. So like, uh, the transdermal stuff's a little bit different. Then also now some guys are injecting into uh, body fat, which is a lot easier than it is to inject into muscle. So I took uh probably on like three, four cycles when I was younger. And for me, I've openly spoken about the fact that when I became a PT, I wasn't in the best shape and I wasn't that experienced. So I was like, well, I can fix one of those. And I went on steroids a few times and it was like, it was like a, a 12, 15 minute training holiday. <laughs> Where like, I didn't go out, I didn't drink as much. And within like three, four weeks, your mates are like, you're on steroids. And I was like, that feels kind of cool. (laughs) You're like, on the rugby bus, someone's like, you're definitely on gear. You're like, well, thank you. Um, (laughs) But then you you have such a good time on it. Your pumps are amazing. Your workouts are insane. Your strength increases. But also your mood is just incredible. Your sex drives through the roof. You wake up like, let's go. But then when you come off. Write this down, yeah. I need to get some of this. Then you have to stop because otherwise your testicles can atrophy to the point that they might not bounce back to the way you'd want them to. And you can run protocols during cycle to keep them going, but there's going to be a lull after where no matter how good your nutrition is, your sleep, you just start losing everything that you had. You keep some of the size, you keep some of the gains, but getting weaker whilst everything is optimized, you're kind of like, oh, this is a bit shit. But I've often said to people like, well, we're in this weird kind of mode where everyone did cycles of steroids, but bodybuilder doses... And then when we saw TRT come into the mix where 
there are going to be a populace of men in the UK who have hypogonadism where their testicles don't do the job they need them to as far as production producing optimal tests. And when you give those guys testosterone and bring them to baseline, there's a massive, you know, amount of health benefits to that person. Yeah, yeah. we were talking about this last week, weren't we? Because it's, it's basically impossible if you go to a doctor, they'll send you to a fucking shrink. They'll like give you like antidepressants. But the, the, for it, people in England to get, or Britain to get prescribed TRT is, is notoriously difficult, but it's more dangerous to have low testosterone than it is to... Because there, there are a lot of, a lot, well, I see uh, Facebook ads and stuff now uh, from, from different clinics or companies that are, that are doing it, you know, TRT in the UK now. Well, you yeah. Can, yeah, like it's, pri- I guess it's private, right? So you well, can you pay. Tory Britain, mate, if you, I mean, if you, <laughs> if you, pri- you pay for anything. But what, like with TRT, uh, sorry, we'll go back to, to your cycle in a second, but with TRT, Adam's 38, he's still, he's still in good nick, but. Really. What, what age would TRT be like beneficial, do you think, roughly? But this is where we get into this massive, like, ethical debate on it. There's a coach that I've trained jiu-jitsu with, and he's in amazing shape. And I'm like, you want a bit of the sauce? And he's like, <laughs> I am on a bit of the sauce. And I was like, tell me your rationale. He goes, mate, I've got two kids. I work in a gym all day where we haven't got windows. He's like, my nutrition's on point, but I don't get enough sunlight or enough sleep to optimize my levels of testosterone. He's like, I'm looking at 10 years of not getting enough sleep or sunlight. I need to optimize my testosterone in a different way. And I was like, oh, fair enough. I was like, cool. Like he knows that down the line, maybe, you know, it's like uh, the way I compare it is I have a golf R. If I modded my golf R, I'd get more performance out of it. But I'm probably going to shave a few miles off the, the, you know, that engine might be able to do 200K. You put like a stage two mapping on it, you might only get 150 out of it, you know, but that's the risk that you have to mod the car. So similarly, it depends on, for instance, myself, I keep it, I get my bloods tested one a year. I'm kind of hoping they'll get low enough. You know, I'm like, <laughs> I might start sleep depriving myself before doing my test. And I'm like, oh, 200. Damn, God damn it. I'm going to have to go and test off. God damn it. You know, like, um, but yeah, like uh, everyone's going to be like case dependent, case specific. Uh, it is a pretty long, say you go on it TRT for a year. You're, you're pretty much on that for life. So once your testicles shut down, you also got, um, there's, there's uh, if you haven't had kids yet, so a lot of guys might go on at 34, 35, where t- typically I think dudes in their mid thirties just get a bit comfortable because their professional life does so well. So, you know, we said about the status thing before, when you hit 34, you suddenly you've got a nice house, you've got a nice car, even on finance, you're at the petrol station, guys are going, nice car, mate. You've got kids, you're a good dad, all of this. Suddenly you don't need to have the The physique. fuck are you looking at me for? <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to have the physique you needed when you were 23. So That's naturally true, yeah. you just start to relax a bit. So dudes all go, this is my life story. <laughs> this is me like, That's why. <laughs> so I think that when, when men get to 34, they have a bit of a slump. And I think a lot of dudes are probably jumping on TRT prematurely because they're looking for a reason uh, to make that go away. And there's a, uh, do you guys watch UFC at all? Yes. Oh, he loves it, man. I try, man, but because like Paddy, Paddy the Baddy guy, was like, he's a big fan of my videos. But like, I think because of that, I kind of want to see him get knocked out. <laughs> also, he won't like it. He, he keeps saying, "I'll fucking beat that beard guy, lad." But that he actually won't eat with me. Sorry, go. On. I don't Tangent. care. I don't care. <laughs> There's a guy on it this week called Bo Nickel, and he's like a real high level wrestler. He's going to the UFC and he's banging people out. But he says, and that, this gassed me up a bit. He goes. The guy, they go, are you worried about dudes who fight being on steroids? He was like, well, if they cut corners there, I bet they cut corners in their training. I bet they cut corners in the nutrition. They're trying to mask it by taking steroids. He's like, in some respects, I've already beaten them. And I was like, oh, I felt personally attacked. <laughs> <laughs> but he was like, he's like, these, these guys do fight camps. He's like, I'm ready all year round. He was like, no one can get to the level I'm at. And if they have to take steroids, they're a fucking pussy. And I was like, Fuck. <laughs> Maybe that's me. Maybe that's me being, you know, like, so, um, yeah, I, I think to dudes, they need to protect their energy levels, their vitality. And I think for a lot of guys, especially if you're in like a cold, dark part of the UK and you've got like a, a really difficult, you've got a difficult job and there are stresses in your life. You know, if you've, some people say, oh, if you've got a headache, you take an aspirin. They're like, well, if you're feeling like you haven't got that drive and, you know, same feeling as you were, you could medicate that if you want. It's just understanding the repercussions of it. And then you will have to get blood work done regularly. You will have to inject two, three times a week. Yeah. You will have to, you know, some bodybuilders I speak to, I'm like, oh, you're worried about fertility? They're like, no, Ronnie Coleman had four kids. And you're like, oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> the fertility thing would not bother me. The only thing that would bother me would be gyno and maybe hair loss. So the gyno stuff um, can be, 
as long as you're on a sensible dose. So the gynecostia comes from, a pro- and again, I'm not Derek. I could be butchering this. It comes from a process called aromatization where excess testosterone is being converted. So if you were on a TRT dose, some could argue that you wouldn't be going high enough for that conversion to take place. Then you should have things on hand. So when I was on cycle four, I remember I got like really sensitive nipples. So I messaged, I messaged my dealer. I was like, he's like, there's a certain level of normality to it, but he was like, how sensitive? I was like, pretty sensitive. He's like, come round. And he gave me this thing called a Rimadex, which is a estrogen inhibitor, I think. But he was like, be careful with this because when you kill your estrogen to stop gyno, you kill your gains because you need estrogen to build muscle. And I was like, mate, this is, I remember going to my doctor and I, I went to see my GP. I was like, look, I think I'm aromatized. And they're like, what's that? I was like, excess testosterone, estrogen. He's like, I've got no idea. I was like, aromatized inhibitor. He's like, I don't know what that is. I was like, fucking hell, you're my GP. Yeah. Why, you know, help. And then you go into forums online of bodybuilders that are giving you advice, but they had crippling gyno. I'm like, why am I getting advice from you? <laughs> it's the wild west, isn't it? So uh, that one, the hair loss, potentially. So yeah, like, I'm already, I think I'm already going a little bit thin on top. Oh, it's, it could be because I've got long hair and I don't really wash it enough. But you anyway. know, another thing, like we get into the hair. One thing, right, I've, I've started receding. I'm going a bit thin on top. To the point, I'm definitely going to wear a hat for our video to save 200,000 people from coming to my hairline. But <laughs> I'm happy to just go with it because I've looked. You go to any country that's not obsessed with TikTok or whatever. I'm, I think I was in Croatia and there's loads of locals sat around. Like, they were all bald or going bald. And... None of them are bothered about it. I think I'd be cool. I'm, I'm, I'm actually all right, I think, going bald there. Like, if I still had to lose this, that'd be a problem. But. You've both got really good beards, though, aren't you? So you'd be... That's a good beard. Yeah. yeah it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's neat and tidy. Yeah. yeah. Mine grows a bit gingery, though, if it gets too long. You should have seen his, man. Yeah. He when he grew in a, a, a while back. <laughs> but, like, let's say your hairline, for instance. Yep. I'm not attacking you. We can see a bit of receding happening. We see a bit of thinning at the front. But this is just the normal part of being a fucking man. Yeah, man, that's uh, you, it is odd. Like when you see people, like people keep flying off the. What was that? You were talking about that the picture of people on a turkey, on a, isn't it? On a like, plane. Yeah, yeah, they all come back with like mega white teeth and like that that wrap on their head because they've had yeah. a, a head. But so. now, whenever I see a perfect hairline, the first instinct is to go, "They've got good genetics," which is what they're trying to do, right? Because we we have certain traits that we associate with inferior genetics. If you've got a really poor shoulder to waist ratio, for instance, like women are attracted to, they'd rather a guy have wide shoulders and a thin waist than they would, you know, have big pecs. Dudes get pecs to impress other dudes. If you want to impress women, you get wide shoulders and a slim waist, right? So then um, also, if you look at across history, men with big jaws are often in positions of leadership. You know, height is a sought after trait. I think 60% of CEOs are above six foot. So you have these things that we straight away look at someone and we start putting together deep voice, big jaw, you know, thick neck, wide shoulders, thin waist. We're like, this guy's ready to take us to fucking war, right? But then when, for some reason in society, we've got this connotation of hair loss being bad genetics, when some of the most masculine men in history have gone bald, Bruce Willis, you know, all it, <laughs> like no one's, if you watch Die Hard or Nicolas Cage throughout his entire stint in the 90s of amazing films has got like Homer Simpson haircut like, yeah. I watched Con Air last night actually it was, on, it was, it was on I love that film it's it, a terrible film but it's a good film and no one's there going who needs a fucking hair transplant true yeah but now we've got all these guys with perfect hair and then when they go to Turkey when they come back most of them have to take uh, finasteride and minoxidil which are two compounds for life and when you see someone's have a, have a hair transplant and it starts to go again it's often because they haven't taken the drugs but finasteride because I looked into this. I, if you start taking these drugs, you can stop your hair loss in its tracks, so they say, marketing. <laughs> but there are some adverse side effects some men get to it. So I think uh, suicide ideation, uh, loss of sex drive, erectile dysfunction. Motherfucker, I better not take this shit. <laughs> I'll yeah. be done for. You can find me swing, swinging from the beam out, beam out there. So I was like, what would I rather have? Like, And even if it was only 10% of people, I was like, do you know what? I'd rather just... Go bald, go bald. I had no idea you had to take uh, tablets for life after having it Some done. people don't take them, but the new era, people that have gone in the last few years do. Even Mike Thurston, right? You know him on YouTube? No, I feel like I know the name, but I don't, I don't really watch He's YouTube, like one maybe. of the most dreamy guys ever. Like t- to the point that sometimes you don't look at his pictures straight to it. I have to just, while you tell me, I'm going to look at I'm, I'm going to find him. <laughs> yeah, Mike Thurston. And Thurston's looking, in like the Bakers. Uh, T-H-U-R-S-T-O-N. Yeah. And then when I'm looking at his, I was with him in Dubai recently, I'm looking at, I'm just looking at his hairline and I went, is that real? 
It's now. <laughs> so had it done. I think like, if you had it done early enough, people don't realise. Uh, and I was like, fuck it. There's me thinking this guy's got amazing yeah. hairline. But they're, they're all cheating. They're all <laughs> cheating bastards. Like I saw Jordan Peterson's had a hair transplant. David Beckham's had a hair transplant. All of these fucking like old... Jordan Peterson? Jordan Peterson. That, like, uh, that, uh, the, the, the really hard line conservative guy that talks a bit weird. Yeah. We're talking yeah. about the, the guy in the suit. He got famous because yeah. he wouldn't use pronouns or something yeah. on campus. He's had a hair transplant. They've all, they've all had it. <laughs> Everyone. Rogan had a, a, a bad Con, one, didn't he? Conor McGregor. Has hair McGregor one? <laughs> yeah, you, can, you can now Conor see McGregor. his uh, his hair transplant from where his uh, hair naturally recedes because I suspect he's not been taking the medication. Well, you talk about McGregor's hairline there and having a hair transplant. He's recently, he's on the comeback, I guess. It's uh, talks have been on the UFC 300 card. <laughs> he snapped his leg in half and he got very, very big. So has he been on the special sauce? Oh, yeah, he's been on the HMS good shit, 100%. <laughs> I, think, I think he'd even agree to that. And do you know what? If you're coming back from an injury, why wouldn't you? I'd be like, give me everything while I'm out the testing window. But the thing is, do you see him get on the mic at that event of the weekend? He was like, Dana, I was supposed to fight in December. Then you said it was supposed to be April. Like, they're not picking him for fights. And, you know, like even, um, do you see Volkanovsky had, he took a fight on 10 days notice yeah, and got head kicked and knocked the fuck out. And then in the press conference, he's a bit like, you've got to keep me active. This guy's one of the most decorated fighters of all time. And he's kind of saying like, please give me fights because these guys go crazy without yeah. them. And I think Connor medicates with drugs and alcohol because he's been geared up, in my honest personal opinion, quite heavily. Like, and you see his jaw going a little bit, a little bit of that. What's concerned? Geared up in what do you mean? That cat's like steroid gear or like... Cocaine. Right, okay, right. Like you can, in my personal honest opinion... You can see it. And even in Saudi Arabia, I'm like, mate, did you get some of that shit out there? Like, if anyone could do it, it'd probably be him, right? Yeah. And yeah, he's, you, there's, there's enjoying yourself. There's having time away from it. There's making a billion pounds or euros from your uh, whiskey and you, and you get like a, your uh, Ford Star Stout, which is actually really nice. Like, I went to his pub in Ireland. It's a good pub, isn't it? The food's amazing. The food is amazing. Yeah, we had, we had a black burger there. That's me to go there. But then you told me it was in a fucking tip. You told me it was in like a really bad area of town. Now, I don't know if it is or it isn't. We got dropped off by a taxi driver. We went, yeah, it's a bit rough around here. It looked like it was next to like a little well, or something, like a one stop. stop. Every taxi driver we went with said that Conor McGregor's a cunt and it's a bit rough well, around Well, I mean, here. it's not just like a statement of fact. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. But, but yeah, like um, he definitely was on the source. His comeback, just every month it goes, he's already out of it a little bit. And he he kind of fucked his own career when he came away from UFC to fight. Um, uh, fight Mayweather. Mayweather, Yeah. yeah. And then he was so inactive for such a long period of time, it's very difficult for him to come back. How can he even possibly come back, right? You know, if he's been out of the game for that long and he's been injured, but like how f- how far mixed martial arts advances in such a short period of time? Like the, how is he going to hold? I don't, I don't think he holds with anybody anymore. No, and this it's kind of sad. All of us in our hearts we want to see him come back and bang someone out and, you know, like a Jose Aldo fight yeah. or something like that. But... Yeah, you kind of. You've got, I think you've got sympathising with him a little bit on the class eight. It's because so we had Paul Smith on the podcast. Do you know Paul Smith, the Scouse comedian, Ginger Air? Saw, saw the episode. Don't know. Right. So he has toured arenas. You know, he's like the highest highs. He's on stage and he's giving people the best night of their lives. And then he goes up and like sits by himself in his house, sits and cries in his hotel yeah, room. And he goes like he said, "You like comedians use drugs and alcohol to try and just soften the blow." Imagine selling out Madison Square Garden, you know, double champ, whatever you want to. Yeah, but that's like all to do with like being level headed. Like you can't, you have to be able to recognize that you can't spend your whole life like buzzed off your you fucking can't up, be, can you? Surely you can't be a world champion and be level headed. It's, can... it's called gold medal depression. So most people that get a gold medal become depressed afterwards because you've worked so long to get something. I guarantee you've had this, right? I bet your silver play button was more of a happy experience than your gold one. It felt like it probably felt like more of an unlikely accomplishment at a hundred thousand. Like I popped a bottle of champagne when I hit a hundred k. When I hit a million, I had a balloon and I was like, "Oh, it's a bit underwhelming." You know, at least YouTube sends you something. When you hit it on TikTok or you know hit it on Insta, there's nothing. And it's it's weird because also Conor McGregor. This is one thing that maybe I'm wrong on this, but say you're a millionaire, billionaire, or whatever. A lot of your life is still the same. You know, fair enough, you can get a private jet, but you have the same iPhone, same Netflix, same TV shows. You sit in the same traffic in London, whether you're in a Maybach or a fucking Uber. Like, a lot of life is the same. You're still going to get jet lagged going to Australia, whether it's a private jet or a plane, whatever. But when I look at, like, really, really wealthy people, sometimes I think, fuck, McGregor bought a Lamborghini yacht and he's probably already bored of it. 
Like once you have everything you could ever have wanted in life, now what? Like I feel like being too successful can be a curse for people because then where are you going to seek happiness when you can afford anything? Yeah, no, I, I, I understand that. I think a level of it though is surely like being aware of that, right? I, don't, I, I, I know you can't, yeah. it's hard to like self-regulate because I, I, I'm probably the least happy now. Not maybe not the least happy I've ever been, that's just a bit depressing. But I was far happier when I was fucking flat broke and I was 22 going out, getting pissed every weekend. It's mad that you look back at that because I can very much relate to this. Where even, uh, so I was in limbo for about six years without a visa for Australia. So I was living in a country I couldn't live in. I had to get three month work visas every now and then. I felt like a plane that couldn't land. And now I've got my visa, got my residency, got a house, got a dog. Then I look back at something two years ago and I go, oh, I miss those days. I was like, hold on. I had anxiety for five years at that point. Why am I looking back now and looking at that? And I completely agree. Those nights out where you scrape together 50 quid for a night out and you got blasted. Now I could afford to drink wherever I want and I don't even want to. You know, yeah. like, there's this weird kind of uh, episodic thing that goes through life where suddenly you're like, why are the things that made me so happy before not making me happier now? But it's almost like you become a little bit numb to those 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 things as you go through time or you're just setting those peaks as being so big now we interrupt this program to bring you a special report sorry to interrupt this episode i want to take a few seconds just to tell you about our patreon as you know we don't do any sponsorships around here we don't try to sell you any ball shavers however if you can support us on patreon we have got early access to every episode like this one and future guest episodes that are coming up we've got some big names in the pipeline you get exclusive behind the scenes clips from like when adam's traveling around the world or we're just chatting shit in the studio each episode we record a patreon only section which is a little bit less pg than the actual full episodes you guys can interact with us and help us steer this sinking ship and tell us what you want to hear on this podcast you can get all this for less than the price of a pint and it saves us from having to flog some ball shavers so if you can support us on patreon back to the episode you're constantly setting yourself new challenges right so you're just you're, like adam con- continues with youtube and is very very successful with just youtube but you've got other avenues that you challenge yourself business jujitsu um like social media every other you've got these other challenges i always said i keep saying to adam i'm like you need to uh, come try jujitsu you know give yourself something else it don't cost you anything. it might cost you an injury but exactly that's um, what i'm worried about like having other challenges outside of i guess monetary gains of Things. Well, I don't make anything out of this, do I? Well, no, I mean, none of us do. <laughs> I'm supposed to be doing a film this year, actually. What acting in a film? Yeah, well, I keep, I'll keep. I'm not, I signed right. an NDA, right? But right. It's, it's, it's not the one you think. It's a different one. Really? Entirely. Yeah, I didn't tell you about it, but uh, it's like only a bit part. Got to play a gangster with a morbid sense of humor. I thought it's perfect for me, you know. <laughs> but yeah, so that. But I've been getting paid for it. But like, it's not. Um, it's not. Yeah, it's not, not the good. It's not a challenge. Doing, though, yeah, that's, yeah, that's yeah, the reason right, I'm doing yeah, it. Yeah. It's to fucking feel something. It's crazy, right? We we mentioned briefly just off there there about living somewhere new. That can be a challenge. Like, oh, yeah. I know it'd be difficult for the podcast, but you should be like... <laughs> it's a shit podcast, mate. Right? Right? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I'm like, oh, <laughs> going to spend three months living in a different country, you know, like uh, up, upheaving everything and doing something. That can be a challenge. The reason I love jiu-jitsu as well is because like, I could sell out the Hammersmith Apollo, then turn up to training the next day and have the shit kicked out of me. And then, or I had like an event in Australia that was my biggest event I'd ever done. The next day I went to a comp, lost in my first match, I had to go home. And I was like, there's, there, that's out of my control. But like, um, Do people ever clock you at an event and go like, I know that guy, I'm going to beat him up? Uh, now, nah, people are quite respectful. and Or like, sometimes you're putting a pen before you fight. So like, they'll be like- A okay. pen? Yeah, so like- literally. A fucking animal pen? Yeah. <laughs> so they'll be like, okay, male, adult, under 99 kilogram, purple belt, please come to the pen. So you and the eight guys in your bracket all sit in the pen together. Then they call you, James, Robert, out you come. And like, you've just looked at this guy in the eyes for the first time you got to fight him. That, that's pretty scary. But what I've come to realize is every bit of fear I feel, they feel too. In my head, I'm like, I bet he's been to prison. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like uh, if he's got a tattoo, I was like, I bet he's my lad. Um, but they, they experience that too. But people are actually quite respectful. But uh, I always like to make up situations in my mind. So for instance, I'm a purple belt now. And I like to fictitiously, in my head, think that people think I shouldn't be. So that when I roll with them, I want them to think, oh, fucking hell, it's better than I thought. So that's what I'm training for all the time. Yeah. Just in case they bring it, they bring the smoke. Oh man, we should have definitely got the mats out and had you two go out. Are you joking? That would have been hilarious to me though. Yeah, because yeah, you would have got your fucking yeah, ass handed to you. Yeah. That's why it would have been funny. No, no, um, but the, the best thing is when I train, I only like being 10% better than the person I'm rolling with. Yeah. So I'm not going to do any dumb shit because the, the most disrespectful thing you could do to anyone is injure them. 
like even sometimes I get annoyed with people at training when they don't tap, I tap for them. Yeah. I'm like, you fucking idiot, you should have tapped there. They're like, oh, you didn't tap me. I'm like... But some people are like that. Though. So like I train at AVT with Danny Mitchell and I trained for four years, got my blue belt. And then like two months after, Tom LCL. Like, I w- admittedly, that was my fault, but there are some people on the mats that are just, they will try to take your arm, take your leg, take your heel home with them. I can tell a lot about people by rolling with them. You know, like, yeah. it's like you meet them in real life and then you have a roll and you're like, oh, I've got you figured out now. Like, oh, you really don't like being embarrassed or you don't like taking a backward step. And it's kind of like a beautiful dance, but it's supposed to be collaborative. But interestingly, uh, I was in Dubai recently. Uh, first time it happened last year. I trained and this guy comes up to me, he goes, the Sheikh has invited you to his house. And I was like, oh, cool, what's his name? And got the name of it. And you got these regions in Dubai. So you got Dubai as a region, but then there's one next to it called Shajar. And it was the Sheikh of that region. And I said to my dad, oh, I've been invited to the Sheikh's house. And he goes, he's a billionaire black belt. And I was like, oh, he's a black belt, sick. <laughs> Go to his house. I look at his Instagram. He had Steven Seagal there the week before. He had like Anderson Silva, like anyone who was big in that world, he'd had him around his house. And part of me foolishly thought, Maybe he got his black belt because he's a billionaire. This guy's like 50. He fucked me up. <laughs> like, fucked me Plus, up. Plus, you went to his house and he had the mats out ready. So you go to... <laughs> That's the weird shit. Like, <laughs> like, we'll go, come to my house, get on these mats. <laughs> so they don't let you in the house. They have like a, an area. And I'm not sure the like uh, Arabic word for it, but it's like, it's almost like a lad's room. They have the football on, someone serving tea, sofas all the way around it. So like you would never go near his family home because his wife and daughters would be there. But then there he goes, let's train. And we walk down a corridor and he has a jiu-jitsu gym in this. And there's like a black belt European champion there. And I was like, do you live here? He's like, yeah. Full time lives at this guy's house, just teaching him jiu-jitsu. And both of them- f- He got money. F- fucked me up. And yeah, so <laughs> that, that was a humbling moment where I got a 50 year old guy who's part of a royal family absolutely twisting me up. I couldn't walk properly for like a few days after I just trained with him in Dubai. That was amazing though, to be fair. Mate, imagine that, imagine that. And he goes and competes in like South America and no one knows he's like a shake, like royal family, wow. UAE. Probably a good job nobody knows. How do shake. you navigate injuries? How old are you, sorry? 34 and a half. 34 and a half. So like, have you had any- <laughs> Half in there. Have you, ever, have you had any major injuries through jiu-jitsu and like, how do you mitigate that? Rugby was worse. Rugby right. was worse. And also if someone's a bit spazzy, I'll just say to him like, well, <laughs> Relax, mate. Good you know, George. You know, it's like it. <laughs> Spazzy is an adjective. You can't say spastic. Well, you said it now. I, I, I didn't say it. <laughs> um, so like, if people are a bit excited, and again, they say that a white belt with good intentions will injure more training partners than a black belt with bad intentions. So uh, there's the Dunning-Kruger effect where people that know the least think they know the most. So like, um, imagine even in competitive... It's called the Diane Kruger effect. Dunning Kruger. I thought, you said, I, meant, I thought you meant like the actress. You know, <laughs> Diane Kruger who was in the National Treasure. Sorry, go on. I bet you experienced this. Someone who's never done an eating competition. I could do that. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's but, like the most nice. It's quite funny to me. But then that. someone that's done anything goes, wow, that's actually really impressive. So like, the more you know about the subject, the more you realise you're fucking shit at it. So we have the same in jiu-jitsu. But no, nothing too bad. Just like sprained fingers. Like nothing, nothing diabolical. Not an LCL. But... It's almost, it's their duty of care, but it's your duty of care as well to protect yourself. Your yeah. foot would have come too close to you. And you should, was there someone on top of you? Nah, I zigged when I should have zagged. I, I, Did you sit up? <laughs> yeah, I sat up, yeah. Fit in 50-50? No, I, it, it, it doesn't matter what. Like, he was trying to impress a girl, I think. No, it was a black belt. I, I, I was rolling with a black belt <laughs> and we'd sort of stopped and he'd shown me some techniques and it was like, it was like, like Sunday morning rounds. Um, and he, 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 he said, do you fancy another round? Uh, uh, one more then, after we'd cooled down. He grabbed all of my ankle and I turned the wrong way. Oh, yeah. So I stood up and went, literally just turned the wrong way. And that just popped. It, it, I heard it like a few pop, 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 pop. And they're and like, oh, fuck, no. <laughs> and that was that was me out for like a year. Yeah, maybe don't start. No, I, I've no intent. I'm not a man of but violence. We do, like he did, so every year we've done these music videos and he, we've both got sisters. And, and whenever we're together, like, for too long, he thinks he's like wants to have a fight or a scrap, and he's always like, he's always like giving me the old jabs and Just stuff. Shadow box him a bit, you know, like like last. So like I'll heel pick him or like arm drag him, and we did it this time. And George filmed it. <laughs> he did it in front of everybody on a full set. It was like twenty people. I, like embarrassment's not a thing for me, man. Like I didn't care. 
I was hoping you fucking choked me out, but we were about fucking 40 hours in at that point. <laughs> I've literally, I've dragged him, took it to the floor. I just, I was in, in full mount and you just see like I said. What you don't realise is we, <laughs> we, we, we would be in significantly different weight classes because you're a fucking fat cunt. <laughs> <laughs> Can I say that? Believe I do. And, and, and second of all, yeah, like you have this, what, what I was saying is we, if you want to have like some kind of like combative thing, It'd need to be like striking. I'd still right. possibly lose, but at least I'd have, the, I'd, in this. I'd have the advantage. Yes, yeah, but do you know, do you not know find that like humans, animals, children, they all just want to have like a bit of a duff. We used to call it a duff when I was growing up. Like say I wanted to watch cricket and my mate wanted to watch something else. His dad would be like, right, put the pillows out. Yeah. Have a yeah, yeah, yeah. And like no striking, no hurting each other, no groin shots, but you just wrestle it out till someone gives up. <laughs> and like, I, I just find that even in, so many things could be settled if everyone knew jiu-jitsu. Imagine that, like two kids in the playground, right, to the mats. No no striking, like, you know, that's a cheap shot. Or if you want to box, put gloves on, go somewhere else. But if people knew how to fight, again, Dan and Kruger, they'd realise how helpless they are. Yeah. And then... Oh, yeah, I know. I'd be, t- I'd be completely useless. I'm a lover, not a fighter. I don't think I would want to get to a fight. You don't even love Yeah, neither lover nor fighter. But isn't it fun when you've had a few beers just to get someone in a headlock? Like, you don't want to hurt them, but you want to get them in a headlock. He's that kind of guy. He was in the Navy, though, you know, they're, they're kind of like that. I don't really want... No, I'd rather just... It'd be all right. I think it's like... It would be good if more people... Like you said, mo- most people think they can fight and then they quickly realise that they can't fight. I, my daughter's going to be three in March and I can't wait to take her down and start, like, at the juniors class because I think it'd be such a good thing to have from you your daughter fight fighting at three years old yeah but they just get a good wrestling and there's like rules and there's adults watching make imagine sure like, how good that would be like a, a, like one of those underground like fight clubs for really young people <laughs> betting on them you can either, they can either go swimming or jiu-jitsu like oh you know swimming boring how often are they in the sea you know so, are they around people all the time that was tea. true yeah if you just avoided the sea you would never drown how how was it at b team jiu-jitsu i know you're like you're not aware like of who they, they are well first of all you got all the professional athletes that have to protect themselves because they're out of a job if they get injured. So the actual level of rolling isn't as crazy as you think. It's very technical, controlled. Uh, they're very on top of it. It was, yeah, it was great. It was, um, it's cool. They're all very friendly. Whether or not, because I've got a few million followers, it might change a few things. But <laughs> no, no, they're, they're actually like sound. But um, it's crazy. You go, Aust- have you been to Austin? Texas? Yeah. Yeah, a couple of times, yeah. You've done like Terry Blacks or something. Terry Blacks? Uh, that most famous smokehouse. Did not go there. Uh, no, but like, I, I don't really go there for like the quick. If they didn't, if they don't have like a food challenge on the menu, which is real, then uh... Terry Blacks get a food challenge. Um, <laughs> but yeah, there's this like really old abandoned shopping mall, and you have got like one of the most profitable jujitsu businesses in the world in the middle of it. But Austin is it's a cool place. Like obviously you got Rogan there, Elon. It's like a big hub. The comedy club was unreal. Oh uh, yeah, uh, comedy uh, mothership. How was it? But they lock away your phone, which is quite cool actually. Like you actually physically couldn't get it out if you want. Then all the security and comedy mothership have got fully cauliflower ears. And like, yeah, like they're all jujitsu guys from like the different gyms. It's like half of 10th planet, just a uh, security there. But you know what? I've watched a lot of Rogan online. He was really funny. I don't find him funny online. When I watch his specials on Netflix, I'm like, this isn't me. Um, and another one recently where, uh, do you follow Andrew Schultz? Yeah. So his stand up last year on Netflix was good, but his most recent show is unreal. Like I couldn't believe it. So the com- these comics, I feel like they're saving their best bits for when you're in person. I feel like there's this new wave of where they don't put too much stuff online. They keep their best bits for when they're in the crowd that's, to make it special. That's like Paul, because uh, Paul Smith, who we're talking about as a comedian, he, he only puts like razzing audience members. He doesn't actually put his material in videos, does he, usually? He, yeah, so like all of his clips are like him just talking to the front row of the crowd work. Everyone thinks that he just is like when they buy tickets to see him, he's going to be like 90 minutes of just crowd work. And that's the first 10 minutes, then there's an actual show, the story, you know, like the story element of it, which everyone do, doesn't You want You want to over deliver to the paid customers yeah. and maybe under deliver yeah. to socials a bit. But yeah, it's, it's really interesting. Um, but yeah, I, I really like America. The Being there the last few weeks was good, but the, the food is insane over there. You didn't do any food challenges to warm up while you were there. So I did one with James Webb. Yeah, he's uh, a good lad. Yeah, he's a, he's an animal. Like, um, but again, Webby, if you're watching this, I said, hey man, do you want to do YouTube video together? He chooses an outside food van <laughs> next to a motorway on the coldest day ever. I was like, there was no production thoughts in mind. I had to like when I when I fiddled with the audio so we could actually hear each other. It was it was just pretty terrible, and then. You know, being in like a nice lit environment, we could have really like replicated something good. So yeah, and it was a burger and chips, which I feel like we could have. To be fair, the one we're doing today is a burger. 
I, I mean, I try to look at something more interesting, but there's not really much around. I'm not like, a, I, I only go to places that do real food challenges. I'm not just going to go down to McDonald's and eat like fucking 40 burgers or whatever. I know, but burger and chips is good because then if you, if you, if it was like a fucking 40 inch pizza, a lot of food wastage. If there's chips and like a few patties, it's more forgivable. How big is this burger? What's the... I don't know, really, to, to tell you the truth, but I, don't, I never really, you know I me, mean, man, I don't research them that well. It, look, it looks big, but it, it doesn't look insurmountable. What have you done to prepare for this food challenge? Let's get breakfast. <laughs> right. I had one of these. I'm going to try one of these. Yeah, go on, let's have a taste. Head. Like, crack them both of them, you can uh, decide which is the, the best flavour. I'm going to do one at a time, mate, if that's all right with you. Yeah. But no, it's a real art to it, and I was talking to him. I was actually fascinated about, like, you know, behind the scenes of prepping. He's, yeah, he's, he's ranked slightly higher than me. I think he's, what, he's number four. Did he tell you? He's number have four? you seen his fucking jaw? Yeah, he's like a, like a heavy genetic advantage, but uh, <laughs> he does. He tries really hard, man. Um, but yeah, he's, he's. But yeah, I don't know what fuck I'm ranked these days. I don't really try that much. But he, um, yeah, I, I asked him if he like trains his jaw, like, and he said it was pretty big before. But like, um, he, I said to him, he's doing all the hard parts. The easy part would be just curating slightly better stories to his content. Uh, what flavor is your favorite? I think I like this one more. That's a little too tropical, you know. I feel like maybe that'd be nicer in summertime. I think yeah, they should be chilled, to be honest. But one's like Fanta Zero. The other one's a little bit like White Monster. This is a little bit more... Um, what's the word? It's not quite as... A, it's, it's a more discreet flavour, you know? It tastes nice, but it's not like overly... So we... Um, this is like Lil or some shit. Chris know? Williamson, <laughs> he flew with a, a suitcase full of all our competitors' drinks, Derek's drinks, everyone's. And we put them all on the table like this. And we're at this like lab in Liverpool where they formulate all the tastes... And we had everyone else's and so many drinks are so sweet, like too sweet to the point that you feel a bit sick halfway through. So we spent like a whole day there. And to be fair, Chris has this like, he's almost like a sommelier of, he was like, that's Ethritol. That's so close. I was like, mate, these all taste the same. <laughs> I was like, none of the taste is credit to me. It's all down to him. He was like, boss man, can we get 10% more Ethritol in this? I was like, what the fuck? Boss man, he's like the nineteen thirty. <laughs> now I like I like calling people boss, especially when you don't know their name. I, what was I? What was oh, I? I'm brother, right? Uh, brother. Start, you know when you get to a certain age, you don't really know what to call people. You can't really go with pal. You can't say dude anymore. When I was younger, I just said yeah, dude. But like you can't really say that now. So I keep calling people brother. But then it's, he edits a few of the videos. He keeps putting the Hulk Hogan clips in there. You know, he's like brother. brother. <laughs> so yeah, I've stopped saying brother now. You can't say bro. So I don't know. I might just, I'm just geezer maybe. Mate is a, is mate a bit too stubborn? Or? No, no I, w- I would say mate in like normal conversation, but it feels like there's not really enough ingenuity behind mate. You know, it, it looks like you've tried harder if you say brother or comrade, but comrade's a bit political, isn't it? You know I mean? communist, a bit, <laughs> bit USSR. Yes, comrade. <laughs> I'll, pick, I'll pick something, I don't know, but like, uh, yeah, but brother was my thing. So do you think you're going to do this food challenge? Do you think you'll be able to complete? I know we don't know the, the extent I'm, of I'm the details. G- I'm going to give it my own. Come on, mate. I can't have it. Too, too many people lose. You know what I mean? I, I might lose actually. It's been it's been a rough Christmas. I might lose, but I don't think it looks. Imagine, <laughs> imagine that you lose on his video that you were watching it in the video, and then you lose with him. It'd be better if, if James wins. I'll be loving that. So I'll put like random man beats me or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a title. <laughs> so I, it's, yeah, I'm gonna give it my all. Uh, but you know what I found that last the, the, the several times I've done a food challenge, right? I get a bit of pregame nerves. And to the point that I lose, <laughs> I lose being hungry because I get so excited. I get like, not sexually, but you get aroused for stuff, right? You know, when you're like ready to go. Like before you film content, you're like, right, let's go. And you like get in the zone for it. I get to that point that like suddenly maybe it's the adrenals. My stomach's just like shut. Or like sometimes uh, I remember last time I was like so eager to beat someone in a food contest that like my jaw was like chewing in slow motion. I was like, what's going on? <laughs> I've done uh, a one meter hot dog in Melbourne place called massive wieners yeah did that in under five minutes oh nice so we got some potential here there was no pinching folding pressing it was just biting and swallowing uh but then there was a wall of fame and the wall of shame i went on the wall of fame but lost out to one of my friends by a second yeah so <laughs> that i did th- a 346 you, you're not you're not filming with james today mate we, we ain't rushing this one we're gonna take it nice and easy well you can rush that'd be that'd be funny no, but no, I'm, no. I'm not... that's that's where i think my strengths could lie because in speed no, 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 not in speed, oh. in just ability to, to eat a lot. And I did this over Christmas. Actually, I do this all the time. I, you know when you have food in the middle and you pick at it, there's never a lot of food on my plate so I can remain naive to the amount I'm eating. And then I'm just sat there and I'm, I look at my missus. I go, 
I've had nine sausages. <laughs> like, if I put nine sausages on my plate, I'd feel like a degenerate. I'd feel like an absolute wreckhead. Then the fact that I just keep picking, I feel like I'm not eating a lot. Yeah, I love eating like that. It's like American styles. And we did that this year at my sister's house. But my grand was like, my grand's like, she used to be a fucking animal, man. But she, she only did like two plates this year. It was a bit sad. To, I mean, she is nearly 90, but it's yeah, sad to see. Too, but we were like, bad. we were like, uh, signed up eating like nearly the full fucking turkey, which is mad because people have been asking me to actually film that for ages. Should have brought a camera with me. <laughs> do you but ever do know. um like stomach stretching exercises? No. Because I used to, I, like back in the day, I used to actually train to be like, to eat more, which was basically eating loads of watermelon really quickly, which is disgusting. But, um, I, I sometimes I'll do like the the yoga thing like the cobra pose right if I feel really tight like if I've been training abs or something which I very rarely do now because I'm lazy what, what did we eat in London we did a challenge together uh, pancakes the pancakes yeah and you told me afterwards I was, I was telling my sister-in-law on Christmas Day this that if you push your stomach out it yeah. sort of like gives you more room and you feel yeah, a bit yeah. better and there were definitely I, like I was like training it. people on Christmas Day like you, you've got this just push your stomach out of it yeah I'm like oh you're feeling full just get up go for a little bit of a walk <laughs> just you know like pu- pu- push your ribs up there a little bit you see it like if you ever watch people doing like the you know like the actual contest it's fucking stupid watching like stuff like Nathan's man people are jiggling on stage you know <laughs> it <laughs> looks daft Web- Webby was saying like he eats like Huge amounts of vegetables to stretch his stomach. Yeah, that's that used to, that be, be the, that was the trick in in my day. Um, <laughs> but, but now yeah. surely it's more enjoyable to just go have a massive meal. Do you how how much time do you leave before a meal to eat? I like I, I always do a meal a day. I've done since I was like twenty one. Um, so like I would never eat more than that. Today I might like because we're going to be eating a little bit later than I normally would. Um, I'll probably have like a little flapjack or something on the way, just so I'm not like. I am here with James Smith. I'm really looking forward to it. You know, like I, I want some energy, but normally it would be like tw- 24 hours um, at least before I eat yeah. anything big. Yesterday I got a bit excited and you know, I was picking stuff and then when I was about six sausages deep, I was like, fuck, I best not have any more. <laughs> but it was too late at that point. But yeah, I've got to give it my all. You, but- you said on one of your videos um, that those people, you know, like when you're explaining calorie counting, there's those people that like um, don't enjoy the weekends and the psychopaths. That's been Adam for eight years. This is why he's the way that he is. He is a psychopath. It's one meal a day regardless. What time do you have that meal? Usually about three in the afternoon. But if I'm filming, I like to film early because like it gives you a couple more hours to actually digest it before bed and it fizzes with your sleep less. So if I can, I'll shoot like 11 or something like that. Normally if we're shooting, it'd be like 11, 12. But some places you can't do that, you know, if they open late or whatever. I went went to this place, uh, the steak place, I think in uh, America, they didn't open till like six. I was like, fuck you, man. (laughs) Can you open a special for me? <laughs> Look, I've got a blue tick. <laughs> <laughs> right, they fucking sell them now. Right? Yeah, true. You, you eating, fucking bought one? Eating steak at 6pm though, like how bad is meat? To be fair, I don't think steak's that bad. Like, they, because steak actually, it sounds like people, that's because they do it in ounces, right? So it's normally like a 70, the big, most famous one is the uh, the big Texan, which I've never actually done in Amarillo. It's in the middle of fucking nowhere. And that's like a 72 ounce steak, yeah. which sounds like a lot, right? But it's actually not that much food. It's like five pounds of food so like for somebody like me that's i'd eat that and i'd, I'd go to bed fine if it's like a hundred ounces maybe it does digest much slower because it's meat naturally but it's um it's, if you were to eat something like pancakes where i lost <laughs> and i always i almost always lose pancakes because they're just fucking horrible to eat but the, obviously you drink at the same time and then you drink afterwards to help it you yeah. know i drink fizzy stuff to help it kind of pass and whatnot but then because it's carbohydrate it, it swells up in your stomach much more than say meat would meat doesn't absorb Water, so I was gonna ask you about just uh, like f- sort of fad diets because it's uh, apparently January is like carnivore month. Um, what was, it, isn't the opposite? That was veganuary, isn't it? It's just what? like the word that's the word. Do you know what? I did it for well, I was supposed to do a month for a video, but then I got COVID like 23 days in and just had a bowl of cereal. <laughs> like, and do you know what? I could have kept going, but at that point, I was like, fuck it, I'm having a bowl of cereal, but I felt way better than I thought. So, I've always been a proponent of like anti carnivore. But I would have eggs in the morning. I'd have like six eggs, maybe like a little bit of cheese. Then I'd just eat meat all day. Quite a lot of sausages, to be fair. Um, <laughs> but then, so we should have a fucking uh, for an English breakfast challenge. Yeah. That's what I'm getting at anyway. No, 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 because I had a lot yesterday. Um, but then towards the evening, uh, it was just depressing my missus because she did it with me. I was like, you just eat what you want. She's like, I can't do that to you. So she would have meat only. And she was like, <laughs> she's getting like, t- I was getting affected by how much she was hating it. But yeah, I felt good. My energy levels were actually really, really good. I thought I'd experience a dip in training, which I didn't because I'm always like a proponent of carbohydrates. I felt like a bit indifferent to, to hunger. There was a few days I was like face down on the sofa. She's like, you okay? I was like, oh, I'm depressed. I want chocolate. <laughs> but like um, all in all, again, like let's say you've got 
a really fat nan or, you know, a family member who's getting a bit carried away, you just need to give them a rule set that they can stick to. You're like, cool, carnival. And then if they can stick to that rule set, a bit like intermittent fasting, most of the magic is the clock doesn't lie. Like 10.45, you know, you don't, you probably need to have an IQ of 15 to understand <laughs> intermittent fasting, right? So like, we're just trying to give rule sets to people that they can't break. Oh, you didn't lose any weight. Did you stick to 11 every day? No, we didn't fucking do it. So <laughs> the carnival one, uh, yeah. And then having a bit of fruit in the evening, it's the only time I've looked forward to fruit. I'd have one piece of fruit a day. Right. And yeah, it felt great. Felt why why fruit? Like, is that against the rule? Uh, no, I think Rogan permits it a bit and he's like the king of carnival. Right? Oh, <laughs> he's the guy. So like, um, but there were a few explosive shits. Oh yeah. A few. And you know, when you look at the toilet bowl and you just can't work out the trajectory, <laughs> you get out, you get out your, uh, what, what is it? Um, what's the, the little semicircle thing getting maths? Protractor. Uh, protractor. protractor yeah. Get out your protractor in the toilet bowl and you go, Marcel was here. Who's there? <laughs> How did it skip the budget? I've done that a few times, yeah. <laughs> I stood in the He split. said there's a picture of a shit once. <laughs> Yeah, tell the story. Tell the story, please. I can't tell that story. Please tell the story. I've sent poos. So, like, I <laughs> basically, this is a long time ago, right? And I can't remember precisely why, but I, I felt really ill, right? After I'd done like a load of eating, right? I, probably because I've been, I think I was, I was in LA, I think it was in LA, and I just basically filmed every day for five days, which I would never normally do, but I was only there for like a, a week, right? Anyways, so I'm like, oh man, I've eaten too much, so I felt ill, and I'm drinking like a Mountain Dew or whatever. Like maybe I was like, oh fuck, I'm, I'm gonna throw up. Which is it's really that red that happened. So I ran to the toilet, right? And because I'm so backed up, I got like, <clears throat> but then because of the sheer like intra abdominal pressure, it just goes. <clears throat> and I look behind me, and there's this hunk of shit like the size of my fist stuck to the mirror, which is behind me, just slowly kind of streaking down. I'm like, that, that's some Tracy Emin shit, that man. You could put that in the Tate Modern. <laughs> Proud moment, but uh, yeah, it's the. There's there's nothing better than having like a nice nine inch turd. And if it hasn't broken, you're like, I can't just flush this. And you know before you wipe, so you wipe and you like stick the tissue to the side of the bowl so that you don't distract the picture. And then you take the picture and then you're going through your WhatsApp like, who could I send this to? And then you're like, Oh, he's he's a weirdo, he'll he'll appreciate that. And you're just there waiting to get you were that guy. That's recognition. About, about like the about times I've had messages like on a Sunday morning my favorite is like I've shit myself. And they'll send this picture oh, yeah, to me yeah. where shit is shit is knickers. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, stopped, I had to stop buying like white underwear, you know, just because it happens. I don't want to say so frequent that I'm like a 90 year old or something, but oh. like it's at least quarterly, I would say. So this is the non-fun part of potentially. Yeah, that's normally if I, just, I overcook it a little bit. Like if I've been over, I've filmed a little bit too much, you know, you backed up, you don't really know what's going to happen then you, and you don't want to lose. <laughs> that happened, like, I think last time I was in Canada when I did that, that fucking huge burger. And the restaurant closed about two weeks later. So it's like I didn't even get the, the honour of being on their wall of fame for anything more than two weeks. It was fucking massive. But I'd been eating for like three days, I think, beforehand, which I never, I tried to space it out, right? I thought, I'll do this, man. And it was like about 11 pounds or something. And then I nearly quit. Like, well, I think I momentarily did quit. Remember? I don't, I don't know. know. Anyways, I remember. But um, yeah, I, I, I was like, right, I'm done. And I went to the toilet and like on the way to the toilet, the guy, the guy said to me, he's like, did you shit yourself? I'm like, oh, was my gait that weird? <laughs> yeah, I, I shit myself on the way to the toilet. But what, it happens. It's hazard, hazard, hazard. But he actually, it, it's weird that he knew that I'd shit myself halfway. I was quite impressed, but uh, I did shit myself. <laughs> this is what the people want. If you, if you go to the toilet, does that count as breaking the rules? No, if you, well, they, like, he could have, like, if I, <laughs> I wish I'd made it to the toilet. No, if you go in there and you're fucking throwing up, then you're going to get disqualified. But like, yeah. if you go and you poop, I think that still counts because that's obviously food that was digested. You know, you ate like eight hours ago or something, not like immediately. Yeah, you'd have to take your GoPro. You'd have to take the table cam with you and just yeah. have it on your face <laughs> while you're there. <laughs> Just so, I mean, you'd be surprised how many people ask me it's like say, oh yeah if you could go, show me your shit after that I'm like oh, whatever you weirdo <laughs> do you remember ratemypoo.com I thought you were going to say something else and, uh, no, uh, no I, don't, I never saw that there was, like growing up you know when it was like e-bombs world uh, there was like all these weird websites steakandcheese.com there was ratemypoo.com where you uploaded pictures of your poo and basically when you got on there you were given someone's poo you could rate it out of 10 and you would just be cycled different pictures and you could, <laughs> so you could put a poo online and see what the public rated it as so would ten be like a real, just a really impressive poo? Yeah, you so said some, that you had one like your forearm once. Oh, some yeah, some awful. swell. Some people get a perfect swell to it, so know. they must be moving their butt as they're doing it, like <laughs> like, like, a whiskey, like a whiskey, <laughs> whiskey whiffy, yeah? Can you imagine being exposed to the world's best poos? Like it was yeah, pretty I would, good. I, I don't know what's happened to don't it. Don't think I would have been on that website. <laughs> Google that, George. It's still going there. The amount of stuff that Google <laughs> George has had to Google, man. I dread to think what's coming up on there. What, what does uh, twenty twenty four hold for you then? Like you've. You, 
we are honored to have you on here because you've been on like the biggest and best podcasts in the world. Well, I was excited to come up here. Like this is the furthest I've ever driven for a podcast. Yeah. So yeah. Oh, oh, we are honored. And then you ended up in Morley. Jesus Christ. (laughs) Like, uh, to be fair, it's a bit of like admiration to what you've done in YouTube space, but in something that is so different to, to what I do. But then at the same time, it's very similar. Like, and uh, there's so many people that I always draw to like consistency, growth over time, like doing the same things. Even once I saw Andrew Short's life, he, he was doing arenas of 20,000 people, hundred dollars a ticket. Australians call it 50 quid. Guy's making half a million pounds a night to go on stage and do what he loves. And he actually had a few of his mates come along and open for him. And I was like, what a life. So I went on his YouTube, I clicked oldest and he's uploaded his oldest video is 12 years old of his stand up. And like every time I get disheartened to someone doing better than me, I just go back and look at their journey and be like, oh, cool. This makes sense. They've been posting longer, more consistently. And they've been getting better. And sometimes it's really good to go back and look at someone's like shitter videos. And then you just realize you're on the same trajectory, you're just not in the same place. So like for me, I, I really appreciate coming on here. And also it's just nice to like rub shoulders with people that are doing well and doing stuff that you like. Man, do you know how many people out there are just fucking boring? <laughs> the fitness industry yeah. is full of them, right? <laughs> Even some of these big podcasts you go on are fucking boring. Like, I want to hear about the shits. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Um, but so, <laughs> 2024, um, going to write another book, going to, uh, or I've just launched like a, a business for helping coaches. So like, it's insane how many people, whether they're black belts in jujitsu or they've stood on stage in physique prep, they give all their attention to that, yet they don't have like a social media strategy. So like, I'm like, oh, do you have an email list? They're like, no. I'm like, cool. So you could explain one position in jiu-jitsu for six hours, but you're not collecting data from people that follow you. Yeah. doesn't make sense. So I have that as a business. I have a PT business that, um, again, working on that. So I got the book, several businesses, probably not at all. Probably go back to Australia, lay low for a while, keep producing content, want to grow YouTube. I'd like to get to half a million subs this year. Um, what you got now? Three, 325. See if we can help out with that. Hey, Are hey. you? After your collaboration today. Don't fuck up the edit, George. <laughs> this one's being filmed with it. Well, actually, the, uh, we're, uh, the second cameraman's outside nearly dying, so <laughs> it might be a one camera show. <laughs> but no, it's, it's uh, yeah, just growing that. And I'm still learning as well. Like, I find that every time I come back to YouTube, I'm like a different person. Even if I look at my videos three months ago, I'm like, I want to unlist them because I'm like, oh, I'm an idiot. Everyone gets like that, man. I want to do it with videos that are like four weeks old. I'm like, oh. <laughs> I really enjoyed your live stream. I watched one of your live streams just to prep for this. And you don't often see people doing much. Like I don't see a lot of people just doing that, just literally going live and answering questions. But that was really refreshing as well. Cause it, it's a bit like a podcast and you get to see the real you, obviously the, the videos that you do are you, but it's, it's more of a punchier sort of planned and thought out. But the, the live streams are really good. Yeah. I like and for YouTube. It's low effort, low return, but it's also just quite nice for people to like see in the flesh. So I try and do those for, my clients but then also i just do one actually when we launched this drink we were given a video to launch it was half an hour long and i was like guys this is a fucking sales video this is gonna bomb and all the comments were people like mate this is fucking shit so i went live straight after and my title was i didn't like the video either and i just <laughs> that's I, genius man yeah and i just sat there and i was like look this is what it is i was like if you want to come at me i'll fight you for the next half hour like you know yeah give me your biggest critique and i'll i'll fucking fight you right now <laughs> and that video sold way more cases than anything else so like i think as soon as i saw the super polished video i was like with the background music and all this i was like this isn't going to go down well because the majority of my content even i butt heads with my videographer i want to i want to record content between 9 and 11 and i want to post it by 4 so i want it out the same day and okay, he's like oh, wow yeah so like i go to training at 11 I want the video, like the first edit sent to me. I'll put it in Premiere. I'll finish it and put it up. And whilst I'm doing like chopping bits out of it, I want the thumbnail. And he goes, let me make the video better. I'm like, I don't want a better video. I want it out the same day. So I'm like a pretty fucked creator in that sense where he's like, oh, just give me an extra day. I'm like, no, tomorrow's another video. Like I'm on that. So you want a daily upload then? Yeah, ideally. And then also I want to get like a reel for shorts. I do say we do a video on Coke Zero. Yeah. Then I look at him, I'm like, cool. When I hear the camera beep, I'm like, let's do it in 60 seconds. So like, I want to be putting out content on all these different socials. And actually I'm more keen for a video to underperform, but to go out. So then the next day I can learn lessons from it. I hate, and this is just, I like doing a video a day, but I don't like waiting for it. I'm so impatient. 
I fucking hate waiting for stuff. Lad, I film them they're up four months after I film them. <laughs> I fucking forgot what I did. That's part of the fun. People are like, oh, I love when that happened. I'm like, oh shit, that did happen here. Yeah. Uh, there's yeah. lots to learn from that. Like, that's that's super impressive, and it shows like your work ethic and shows that that's what sent Casey Neistat. Uh, yeah, yeah, the deal in, in the log, stratosphere, right? right? The whole day. I mean, probably fucking killed him. <laughs> and I killed him, but uh, he did like 500, 600 days. I'm sure he did like two two years or so nonstop. Yeah. But I mean, I suppose it's uh, everyone's got a different strategy. I'm sure it's, uh, people want more as much content as you can provide without the uh, the quality of it reduced. And so, if it's I, pro- provided, I, you can do stuff. I want to become an expert in short form content that's low effort, high return. So I think that's somewhere where, you know, I watch people put all this B-roll in. I'm like, spending two weeks to make a video, if you can have the same impact to that person's life without putting all the effort in, that's my that's my cup of tea. I'm like the op- I think I'm the opposite way on that. <laughs> but uh, you, you, you're you not wrong though, especially like the post, the post TikTok generation. It's miraculous that people tolerate three minutes of me fucking around like an idiot before, before. food comes out. You know, you said, sorry, just, I know you're like wrapping up. You said about YouTube being the constant variable in all social media, which I completely agree with. There's also an interesting turn you know you got all these actors on strike Mm. so a lot of this they say it's about ai but i have a feeling it's a lot to do with the fact that if you have a tv show that goes on to netflix netflix doesn't have to share with the tv show how many views or streams they had so therefore royalties for tv shows is completely fucked like the the guys from friends every time it went on like e4 or whatever they would have got kickback of whatever so actors and uh, movie stars now if the TV show they're creating or whatever medium it is goes to Netflix, to Prime, whatever, and they don't get that back, they don't get royalties, they get a flat fee. So if actors or whatever strike for the next year or so, or we see a slowdown in production of Netflix, all of these things, and I think Netflix is the only one that's profitable. I think of Disney's bleeding money. I think a lot of these other streaming sites are bleeding money because they're paying more than they're getting. These people are going to have to come to YouTube. So a lot of what I'm doing now is kind of preempting. I could be wrong, but I think a lot of people that absorb TV now... Even I showed my dad yesterday, Carwell, how he could look at like reviews of cars. And he was like, I never knew YouTube could do that. And I think we're going to start to see fringe generations. 400,000 people didn't renew their TV license this year. They're going to go somewhere and I think they're going to end up on YouTube. So I think that kids coming in from one end, watching toy reviews, adults and older boomers coming in to learn about shit. I think that every kind of, I think the TV viewing is going to come up if the economic crisis gets worse and people start cancelling their subscriptions, they're all going to come to YouTube. So I think it's exciting. I, I even think like the YouTube subscription's worth the money. It's like £12 a month, you know, to not have ads. Yeah, I don't, I don't pay for it because I don't really watch anything on there, but you're, you're right in, in saying that. And the, the thing about YouTube is that it gets a lot of flack. Again, we are wrapping up, but it, it gets a lot of flack as well from people who are on it. Creators will come whinge about, oh, you know, this happened, that happened. But YouTube, it, it, there are lots of faults with it, but for what it is, I think it's, it's certainly the best like video hosting platform that there is, you know, and uh, video content is the most precious commodity, I think, in, in like in tertiary industry these days. That's why Facebook pays so much to get people yeah. on their platform and stuff. So, yeah, I agree. And if you're going to start a YouTube channel, get on it, man. Yeah, it's been a blast. Thank you so much for coming up. And yeah, we, thank you. We, we do need to wrap up just to get you guys to this uh, food challenge because it's the, it's the, the yeah. big the big thing now. I did, by the way, you told me uh, it was a boss this morning. He's like, have you fucking saw that food challenge? I, I messaged the lady. They are prepared for this. I'm very excited. Oh, amazing. Which is usually a bad sign because that means I'm going to have to go in and be like, yeah, don't double the size of it. <laughs> yeah. Like, give double, us an double it for James, right? But like, give, me, give me the small one. <laughs> give us an out to set off. Yeah, but we, hopefully it'll be all right. But thank yeah, you just coming on, man. Appreciate yeah. it. Thanks for having me. And the drink was nice. Go buy some. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> That's the first ever endorsement he's done ever. It is, he's done it. He's it's nice, it was nice shit, man.